Thank you. That concludes topical questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion 14820 in the name of John Swinney on Challenge Poverty Week. I'd be grateful if members who wish to take part in the debate were to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on the First Minister to speak to and move the motion up to 15 minutes, please. Officer, I welcome this opportunity to open a debate during Challenge Poverty Week in Parliament and I move the motion that stands in my name. As Parliament will know, on the 29th of July, the United Kingdom Government announced its decision to restrict entitlement to the winter fuel payment to those in receipt of pension credit and other means-tested benefits from this winter. That meant that an important provision of financial support that was available to pensioners in the United Kingdom would no longer be in place. Instead, eligibility would be much more limited to those eligible for pension credit and other relevant benefits. This decision was taken with no notice or discussion with the Scottish Government. The decision came as a surprise to the Scottish Government, despite officials from both governments working closely together on the Social Security programme that has been focused on delivering an effective transition to provide this benefit through devolved Social Security powers that this Parliament now holds. As a result of this decision, Scotland's share of this year's block grant adjustment funding is expected to reduce by roughly £150 million. That is over 80% of the cost of our own devolved payment, the pension age winter heating payment. This means we no longer have the funding to offer the payment as a universal benefit as we had intended to provide. Additionally, the timing of the UK Government announcement and the lack of prior consultation with Scottish Ministers means that alternative approaches to universal payment and the means-tested approach advocated by the United Kingdom Government cannot be implemented in the time left available to us. After careful consideration, we have made the difficult decision to replicate the UK Government's approach here in Scotland, should that be necessary. My Government, however, will continue to press the United Kingdom Government to reverse this damaging decision, and we invite the Scottish Parliament to support that view in the debate today. The Chancellor told us at the Labour Party conference that under Labour there would be no return to austerity. But Scottish Government analysis indicates that roughly 900,000 pensioners will no longer be entitled to support with heating costs this winter. That feels a lot like a return to austerity to me. And with Ofgem announcing an increase in the energy price cap from this month, low-income households will be under even greater pressure this winter. This announcement from Ofgem comes in the context of an election promised by the Labour Party to cut fuel bills by £300, only for them to increase at the first available opportunity by, on average, £149. Um, uh, of course, I'll give way to Mr Briggs. Miles Briggs. I thank the First Minister for taking this intervention. SNP ministers do have options, though, and one such option would be to defer the block grant adjustment on the winter fuel payment this year so that ministers could make payments this financial year to pensioners across Scotland. Is that something the Scottish Government has investigated? First Minister. Well, the, the, the issue and the challenge with all of that is that it requires an entire system to be put in place to deal with the mess that has been created by a United Kingdom Government decision. And this Scottish Government spends far too much of its time having to pick up the pieces from the mistakes made by the United Kingdom Government. The cut to winter fuel payments and the increase in energy costs is a double whammy for people in Scotland, and especially for many of the older and more vulnerable individuals in our country. The Scottish Government is working urgently to mitigate the impact of the UK Government's damaging decision. I have written to councils and COSLA to seek their urgent assistance in promoting the take-up of pension credit, as this is the main qualifying benefit by which our older people receive a pension age winter heating payment. And Scottish Government officials have been attending events across the country to raise awareness of the connection between pension credit and the pension age winter heating payment, as well as to provide advice and support. We are also continuing to invest heavily to protect vulnerable households from poverty and to mitigate the impacts of the UK Government's approach to funding Social Security. This year alone, we are spending £134 million on schemes such as discretionary housing payments and the Scottish Welfare Fund, which provide vital support to households struggling to meet their housing and their energy costs. We have also committed £6.1 billion for benefits expenditure 
This is a record for Scotland and nearly £1.1 billion more than the UK Government provides to us through the devolution of social security arrangements. This will help older people and low-income families with their living costs. In total, it will support over 1.2 million people, that's around one in four Scots, when all Scottish Government benefits have been introduced and clients have been transferred from the DWP. And we've consistently uprated all of our benefits in line with inflation, and our intention is to make it a legal requirement to annually uprate all devolved benefits. According to the Scottish Fiscal Commission, this is an estimated investment of at least £6 million for 2025-26, rising to, all, to at least £12 million in 2029-30. Presenting officer, there are some who have questioned and even criticised the level of social security expenditure in Scotland. But more so than ever in these tough financial times, I and my government make no apology for putting more money into the pockets of pensioners, families and those struggling with the cost of living. Yeah. We're also investing over £12 million in free income maximisation support, welfare and debt advice services. This includes support for the Citizens Advice Scotland Money Talk Team service, which last year supported over 9,000 older people. And we've invested in our council tax reduction scheme and free bus travel for older people over the age of 60 in Scotland. And we've provided over £2 million from our Equality and Human Rights Fund to support older people's organisations to deliver work focused on tackling inequality and to enable older people to live independent and fulfilling lives. In all of this, we are continuing our other forms of heating cost support. Our winter heating payment guarantees a reliable annual payment of £58.75 to people on low incomes. And unlike the UK Government's cold weather payment, it does this regardless of the weather or temperature. We are also continuing our child winter heating payment, which last year provided £7.2 million to support over 30,000 children, young people and their families who had higher fuel needs due to disability or a health condition. Meanwhile, our warmer homes Scotland and area-based schemes support people experiencing fuel poverty to make their homes warmer and more fuel efficient. Uh, of course. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful to the First Minister for taking my intervention. He is right to focus on particularly fuel poverty as we come into winter and the uh, rising fuel cap that we've seen. But does he recognise that the rollout of his Warm Homes initiative has been glacially slow and that it would take 100 years for all el eligible homes to be actually fitted with the insulation they need to keep warm? First Minister. Well, it's vital that these programmes have the necessary impetus to take account of the challenges that we face in relation to um, the uh, equipping of homes for the challenges that lie ahead. But that has to be delivered within a costed programme, and obviously that's part of what the Government is prepared to engage with in relation to the delivery of the budget propositions for 25-26. Uh, in the last decade, the Warmer Homes Scotland and area-based schemes have supported over 150,000 households living in or at risk of fuel poverty. All of these programmes and supports are valuable and are making a significant difference to people all across Scotland. But they come at the time where we are having to address the challenges and uh, this debate recognises the difficulty that we cannot continue to backfill UK austerity driven policy decisions. We have taken a number of steps to do so already. But the direct loss of funding in relation to winter fuel payments make that an unsustainable option for the Scottish Government. Yeah. I therefore ask Parliament to support the Scottish Government's call for the UK Government to reverse the winter fuel payment decision and to reinstate the payment as a universal benefit. That is necessary to avoid the abrupt change in policy and provision that has been forced upon us in Scotland. Now, President Officer, reversing this decision on the winter fuel payment will be a vital step in ensuring our citizens can afford to live in warm homes. But there are, of course, many other reforms we need to see from the new United Kingdom Government. We also need reform of the UK energy markets to address the root causes of fuel poverty. We need a social tariff mechanism to provide discounted energy bills to those facing high energy costs such as disabled people, carers and older people struggling with bills. That, this is the best way to ensure that energy consumers are protected against high costs 
and can afford all of their energy needs. Last month, uh, of course, Paul Keane. Much of what he says in terms of what is required to be done is, of course, welcome, and he will hear us wishing to collaborate on this side of the chamber. But I wonder if he can explain to the chamber why his government has cut the fuel insecurity fund and why it cannot say clearly what it will do with £41 million of consequentials from the Household Support Fund, which has been extended across the United Kingdom. First Minister. See, the, 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 the problem with the point that Mr Kane puts to me is that we haven't yet seen that consequential funding. And the, the problem the government has to wrestle with is we have to look at the implications of all of the financial decisions that are taken by the United Kingdom government. Now, what we're having to wrestle with in this debate is a direct cut of about £150 million in our budget, which affects the universality of the winter fuel heating payment. That is what we are wrestling with today. So this is the, uh, the social tariff uh, propositions that I've set out are important for us to take forward. And following a ministerial roundtable, we secured the agreement of energy suppliers to take part in a working group aimed at co-designing a social tariff. There is considerable work still to be done, but this group represents a real and necessary step forward. Unfortunately, the powers to implement a social tariff are reserved to the United Kingdom government. And we've repeatedly called on the previous UK Government to introduce a social tariff as a means of targeted support for those who need it most. Now, those calls went unheeded prior to the election. If we are to enjoy a more constructive discussion with the current UK Government, with the policy choices and aspirations of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government are addressed in a serious, substantial and respectful way, it should be possible for us to make progress on delivering this crucial policy. We are committed to working closely with the UK Government, as well as with Ofgem, suppliers and consumer organisations, to advocate for the delivery of a social tariff across Great Britain. And here in Scotland, we will continue to tackle fuel poverty and support people during the ongoing cost of living crisis using the, using the powers available to us. If the Parliament had more powers, then of course we would be able to do more. And I have no doubt that if the UK Government continues to take decisions such as means testing the winter fuel payment and does not heed calls for, a, for badly needed reform of the energy market, then more and more people will ask themselves why it is that a country as energy rich as Scotland should tolerate such decisions being imposed upon us by successive Westminster governments. Now, President Officer, I recognise the restrictive fiscal environment in which the UK Government, my Government and local Government across the United Kingdom are operating. The budgetary challenges that exist right now are the most severe we have ever faced in the history of this Parliament. But it is a mistake to think that austerity and the restriction of entitlements is the solution to this problem. It is a mistake to think that benefits, action to tackle poverty and other supports for our most vulnerable are costs to be curtailed. Rather, these measures are investments in our people, our communities and our nation's future. We make these investments because, if Mr Kane will forgive me, I better um, uh, begin to draw my remarks to a conclusion. We make these investments because they are right and because they support thousands of people every day all across Scotland. But we also make these investments because they make good fiscal sense. Mm -hmm. They reduce later, greater strain on our public services. They support people to take part in our communities and contribute to society. They grow our economy. They, they, in the long run, they make us all more prosperous as they make our public services more sustainable. Now, I urge, urge the UK Government to deliver an autumn budget that understands this, a budget that is focused on investment and opportunity rather than on austerity, a budget that provides greater funding for public services and infrastructure, one that supports our nation's most vulnerable. And I repeat those calls today. As we begin this afternoon's debate, I hope that members across this chamber will work constructively with us to ensure the powers, levers and funding available to us continue to make the greatest difference to the most vulnerable here in Scotland. The steps taken by the UK Government to restrict eligibility for winter fuel payments are not in the spirit of devolution. In nobody's eyes can it be appropriate to devolve a power to the Scottish Parliament and at the last minute 
withdraw the funds that go alongside the devolution of that policy. Whatever our politics, no member of this Parliament can surely believe that this is an appropriate way by which devolution of powers should proceed. Today, I call on all members of Parliament to unite in a clear statement to the United Kingdom Government that the decision to end universal eligibility for winter fuel payments should be reversed and the resources should be available to this Parliament to ensure this vital support is available to all of those who are currently eligible in Scotland. I appeal to Parliament to work together to make the best investment in our nation and its future. Let us ensure the best possible outcome for the people we represent both this winter and for the years to come. Thank you. I now call on Russell Finlay to speak to and move amendment 14820.1 up to 11 minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, uh, poverty is unjust. It causes misery, crime, illness and premature death. In many parts of Scotland, it's become deep-rooted, trapping generation after generation after generation. And I'm determined that my party will fight to increase opportunity, prosperity and good health for all people across Scotland. Now, this week in Challenge Poverty Week, it's important that we debate poverty and how best that can be tackled. But I believe the debate should be broad and not narrow. And that's why I've amended John Swinney's motion, as it only refers to the UK Labour government's harmful decision to axe lifeline winter fuel payments for millions of elderly people. Now, it's absolutely shocking that Sir Keir Starmer did not conduct any assessment of the impact that his decision would have. That's despite his own party once warning that stopping these payments could result in the death of 4,000 pensioners in a single year. In the depths of a long, cold Scottish winter, we know that the winter fuel payments can be the difference between heating and eating. The anger at Labour across the country is palpable. Mm. They promised change, and this is it. This is what they are really offering people. Elderly folk who have slogged hard all their days feel absolutely betrayed. And many were further angered, angered upon discovering that Sir Keir, a man who certainly doesn't worry about his electricity bill, is a champion freeloader. Now, my party broadly agrees with Mr Swinney's motion. Of course, like all state benefits, however, as in life, nothing is truly free. The SNP often don't seem to grasp this fact. They too often recklessly waste taxpayers' money. But the removal of this payment is the wrong way to go about introducing any form of means testing. Any change of this nature should have been done much more fairly and respectfully and with a sufficient period of notice. And I think the Labour members actually agree with that. It should never have put vulnerable pensioners at risk, as Labour have with this decision, aided and abetted by the SNP. Now, today's debate is timely following the release yesterday of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation report titled Poverty in Scotland 2024. It's an annual publication, and this year it asks how effective social security is at reducing poverty and advancing equality in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And unlike Mr Swinney's simplistic one-line motion, it sets out the complexity of the problem over 100-plus pages. It also contains some truly disturbing data, which really ought to make left-wing politicians in here question some of their preconceived ideas. In the period... I will. Paul Kane. <coughs> I am li listening aghast to Russell Finlay's cognitive dissonance from the fact that his government have salted the earth and have left a situation where the public finances are in an appalling situation. I think Let's it's the time he apologised for poverty in this country, not stand there and excuse it. Russell Finlay. What, what an absolute brass neck. I think Mr O'Kane should be apologising to the pensioners of Scotland for taking their winter fuel payments from them. In the period from 1994 to 1997, 14% of Scottish households in receipt of some benefits were what was described as, quote, very deep poverty. Yet by 2020, 23, there was no improvement whatsoever. And in fact, that figure had actually risen to 15%. And we see a similar pattern in relation to other categories relating specifically 
to child poverty. In each of these, I will. First Minister. I'm grateful to Mr Finlay for giving way. He's just quoted uh, the comparison of figures up until 2023. Does he believe that the contribution of the Conservative Government between 2010 and 2023 in any way contributed to, to the increasing of poverty by the pursuit of the agenda of austerity which he championed? Russell Finlay. Jo jo John Swin has been a member of this government for 16 of the past 17 years. It's in receipt of the largest ever block grant and is unable to spend money wisely. And that's partly due to the reason for the poverty that we're experiencing in Scotland. Now, in, in each of these figures, the SNP, uh, the foundation, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, warns that the SNP government looks likely to miss its own targets. And before any further SNP members uh, attempt to question these numbers, the report data is from the Scottish Government. And I'm usually averse to reeling off statistics in the Chamber. I think they can become a little bit abstract. But many of the numbers contained in this report are informative and consistent with other research. A recent Scottish Government study says that overall poverty has effectively remained unchanged since 1999, from 24% then. It's fluctuated, but is now back at around 21%. And most of the data that I've cited today relates to the post-devolution period. For 25 years now, we've had a Scottish Parliament with a huge array of powers at our disposal. This place has the capacity to make bold changes about the lives of people living in Scotland. I'll need to make some headway. I don't have much time. And throughout this time, successive Labour and SNP governments have pledged to tackle poverty. Mr Swinney regularly tells us that he will eradicate, that's the word he uses, eradicate child poverty. Yet throughout the quarter of a century of devolution, the poverty dial has barely shifted. I believe that we need to spend more time talking about the relationship between social security and entrenched levels of poverty. The Scottish Fiscal Commission has said that the annual social security spend is set to increase to around £8 billion pounds by 2028-29. That's a 51% rise. But it's already the third highest area of Scottish Government spending after the NHS and local government. And it's for those reasons that I've today appointed Liz Smith as my Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Social Security. As a politician who commands widespread respect inside and outside the chamber, and with a thorough grasp of economic matters, Liz will apply some much needed scrutiny yes, to this please. critical area. And I'm not alone in thinking that our benefits system must also be fair to the hard-working taxpayers who fund it. And it must be designed to lift people out of poverty, not to trap them in it. A life stuck in benefits with no opportunity for advancement and no help to improve your lot and get ahead is no life at all. As a new leader of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, I will champion our party's core values of aspiration and ambition. And I will argue that every single child should receive the best possible education. Our party will stand up for everyone in Scotland who feels left behind by the political establishment and who feel that nobody represents them. I don't know if I'll get any time back. We have a little time in hand, Mr Finlay. Pardon? We have a little time yep. in okay. hand. Oh. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I wonder if the member could then tell us uh, who does he plan to cut benefits from? The poorest, the disabled or carers? Russell Finlay. Sorry, imagine putting them into silence. Like Let's hear one another. This is the same Scottish government. The same Scottish government that has demanded control, full control, of the Scottish benefit system for the past ten years, and it's been delayed. And they're wanting, and they're wanting me to Let's do their job Let's hear Mr. Finlay. Ridiculous. People, people in this country feel the Scottish Parliament wastes too much time on divisive policies such as gender reform, and it's drifted away from the real issues that affect their lives. No politician should try to blame the public for feeling that nobody represents them anymore and that nothing will change. There's a strong feeling that politicians are all the same, but under my leadership, we're going to do things differently. We're going to make promises we can keep and we're going to deliver on promises that we make. We're not going to stand here and promise the world as too many in this parliament do. I'm looking at you, First Minister, knowing they will Mr. never Finley, deliver. Mr Finlay, you will always speak through the chair. Thank you.
because people don't expect miracles from their politicians. They just want them to tell it straight and only make pledges they can actually achieve. The SNP and Labour offer different shades of socialism that yeah. keep people down and trapped in poverty. Yeah. They make promises they will never meet, and we will not do that. We will offer an, al an alternative way forward Let's hear Mr. to Finley. the high-tax, low-ambition Hollywood consensus. We will stand up for everyone who wants our politicians to show a bit of common sense for a change. Yeah. We will give people the opportunities to get themselves out of yeah. poverty because we believe in their potential. And we believe if given the chance, people will work their way up and find a way to succeed. Yeah. All they need is opportunity. And that's what this parliament often fails to deliver. It speaks only of giving people a hand out and not a hand up. It spends all its time talking about the problems, not providing the solutions to fix them. There's crushing poverty out there in the real world that stops Scots from getting ahead. And it's not helped by the poverty of opportunity on their doorstep, the poverty of opportunity that this parliament fails to tackle. It doesn't create the new jobs that are needed to give people a chance. It hasn't looked after Scotland's education system. It has not improved health care. Life expectancy is falling under the SNP government. The Parliament has become detached from the bread and butter issues that people are most concerned about. All of these things are barriers to people fulfilling their potential in life. And I want to knock them down. I want to support people's aspirations, not block them. And if we achieve that, only then will we finally make progress on tackling the scourge of poverty. So that will be my party's focus going forward. And I believe it should be what this parliament as a whole spends most of its time and energy on. Presiding officer, I urge all parties to support my common sense amendment today. Either way, my party intends to support the government's motion while recognising that they cannot absolve themselves of responsibility for the winter fuel payment cut. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. And I now call on Anna Sarwar to speak to and move amendment 14820.3 up to nine minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. This is, of course, Challenge Poverty Week, and the Joseph Rowntree Foundation has revealed that one million Scots are currently living in poverty, and that should act as a wake-up call for us all. This is a damning indictment on 14 years of disastrous Tory rule and of 17 years of SNP incompetence here in Scotland. Now, I know the opposition will want to blame a government that has been in power for a few months for the issues we face, but let us not ignore the root cause. A morally bankrupt and economically illiterate Tory government that has been let off the hook by far too many opposition parties. And what Russell Finlay should have been doing was standing up and apologising for the economic vandalism across the UK in the last 14 years. Perhaps Mr Finlay wants to do that now. Russell Finlay. Mr Sarwar clearly agrees with cutting the winter fuel payment for millions of pensioners, but does he agree there should have at least been some form of risk assessment done? So no apology from Russell Finlay, no taking responsibility, and let's not forget this was the man that was backing the disastrous Liz Trust. But also the SNP can't avoid taking responsibility for their own decisions in devolved areas over the last 17 years, because we all have a duty to challenge poverty. I will take the intervention. Ash Reagan. Hi, thank you for taking the intervention. Scotland clearly is an energy-rich nation that should not be put in the position of facing the prospect of Scottish pensioners freezing to death this winter due to the actions of a callous UK government. How can Scottish Labour support this when recent research shows it may result in the deaths of hundreds of Scottish pensioners? Anna Sarwar. Well, Ash Regan is right. We are a uh, rich nation when it comes to our energy potential, squandered by 14 years of broken promises by the Tories and squandered by 17 years of broken promises by the SNP as well. So if we are to challenge poverty, it will require a collaborative approach between both our governments and it will require different decisions being made here in Scotland and devolved areas too. I will, for the final time, uh, First Minister, just because I'm conscious of First the minister. Time. First Minister. I'm grateful to Anna Sarwar for giving way. He's talked about collaboration between the Scottish and the United Kingdom governments. Can I ask Mr Sarwar whether he believes 
It is a reasonable way for the UK Government to behave, where they devolve a benefit and then remove the funding stream that is associated with that. On that very sharp point, does he believe that to be a reasonable act of the United Kingdom Government? Anastasia. So knows that the reconciliation has not happened yet. That means that the £41 million is also an option for the government to use to support more families. And I'll come to that. I'll come to that. In a, I'll come to that in a moment. Because if the SNP is to be credible on tackling poverty, we need to have a proper debate to understand the causes of poverty and how we lift people out of poverty. And the idea that poverty is caused by or solved by a single government decision is simply not credible. And the SNP motion focuses solely on the winter fuel payment in their challenging poverty debate today. So let me address that directly. This is a decision that the Labour government did not want to make, but they are not responsible for the chaos and damage inherited from the Tories. And why the SNP, of all people, want to minimise the damage the Tories have done is for them to explain. So I repeat that the decisions of the, of the winter fuel payment is not a decision that the Chancellor wanted to make. I have always said that I believe the criteria for support based on pension credit is too tight, and I continue to make that case. This year, the winter fuel payment is a devolved payment, and that means we can make different choices. That is why Scottish Labour has laid out a plan to support the most vulnerable in our society. I have taken three interventions already. If I have got time towards the end, uh, First Minister, I will take it. That's why Scottish Labour has laid out. Let me just lay out this, and then I'll let you back in. That's why Scottish Labour has laid out a plan to support the most vulnerable in our society. Now, the Scottish government often says that we need to identify the money. Well, we have. There are £41 million of Barnet consequentials. That was not money expected by the Scottish government. That is money we believe should be used to reinstate the fuel insecurity fund, which was scrapped by the SNP government. Now, I know members are heckling, but the reconciliation has not happened. So the £160 million has not gone, and the £41 million does exist in the Scottish Government's budget. That £41 million can deliver a £200 payment for over 200,000 households. And we have set out options. One option could be to support 200,000 low-income pensioner households. That would mean a third of pensioner households in the country receiving a payment this winter. Another option is to target that payment at low-income households that goes beyond pensioner households. Or a third option is to do a hybrid of both. This would go alongside a campaign to maximise uptake of pension credit because we know that 70,000 eligible pensioners do not claim it. And on this plan, we are willing to work with the Scottish Government to support Scots most in need, because the need for coordinated action could not be clearer. Now, I repeat, we have over one million Scots in poverty. Child poverty rates have risen by 30,000 since the SNP came to power in 2007, some 17 years ago. And the SNP is on track to miss their interim child poverty target, with some 240,000 children remaining in poverty. Now, I accept that not all of that blame lies with the SNP government. It is, of course, in large part due to 14 years of Tory chaos. But they cannot absolve themselves of responsibility. Because poverty is not an inevitable fact of life. It is something that can be tackled and reduced. And there are many areas where we have to make progress to reduce poverty, making work pay, housing, Education, justice, and our NHS. On these areas, I'm just conscious of time, First Minister. On those areas, that are the those are the many of them are the full responsibility of the Scottish government, and they have failed to take meaningful action. You can't tackle poverty if people don't have safe and secure homes. But under the SNP, thousands of Scots are stuck in substandard housing, and tens of thousands are now looking for uh, are homeless and are looking for homes. And we have record levels of children in temporary accommodation. No mention of that from the First Minister today. You can't tackle poverty if children are not getting the opportunity they deserve, but our education system there remains an attainment gap and an opportunity gap with children from working class backgrounds less likely to go to university and less likely to start a business or learn a trade. No mention of that from the First Minister today. You can't tackle poverty if people don't get the health care they need regardless of their background, but health inequalities persist with heart disease and cancers more common amongst the less well-off and life expectancy lower for those in poverty. No mention of that from the First Minister today. And soaring NHS waiting lists are forcing more and more Scots to empty their savings, sell their homes or remortgage their homes to pay for private treatment 
and long waits are forcing Scots out of work, only adding to their economic insecurity. No mention of that from the First Minister today. And you can't tackle poverty if our communities are not safe places to live in. But SNP cuts to criminal justice and policing in Scotland has left communities in a permanent state of insecurity and have led to a revolving door in our prisons for repeat offenders. No mention of that from the First Minister today. And you can't tackle poverty if there is not good, secure work available. But this SNP government continues to view zero-hour contracts as a positive destination for young Scots. No mention of that from the First Minister today. Now, we know that this government likes to talk about what it doesn't have control over, but the fact is there is so much more they could be doing with their powers to tackle the root causes of poverty right now. So if we are to have a credible debate about how we lift children out of poverty and we eradicate poverty in our country, then we must realise that we need a multi-spoke approach to tackle the root causes of this issue. To tackle poverty, we need to make sure every Scot has a safe, warm home. Every Scot a safe and secure community. Every Scot an NHS that is there for them, free at the point of need, and every Scot an education system that helps them thrive and achieve their potential. I realise I'm in my final uh, minute, Presiding Officer, so just to uh, touch upon, we are going to fulfil our promise of the New Deal for Working People and Make Work Pay with the introduction uh, of that bill to Parliament tomorrow, banning fire and rehire, banning exploitative zero-hour contracts, repealing anti-trade union legislation from the Tories and delivering a real living wage, boosting pay for thousands of Scots. That's the change we're getting on with delivering. So if this government wants a credible debate about poverty, they have to accept their responsibility from housing to the NHS, from the economy to our education system. Now, while some in this chamber may want to blame a government that's been in power for three months and at the same time absolve responsibility for one government that was in power for 14 years and another one that's been in power for 17 years. If we are to challenge poverty, it requires action from both governments. Where it's a UK government responsibility, they must act. Where it's shared responsibility, they must both act and cooperate. And where it's the Scottish Government's responsibility, they should act too, putting the national interest before their own party interest. That requires a cross-portfolio, cross-government response. That's what Scottish Labour supports, and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Mr Summer. Could I just uh, advise members that those who are wishing to speak in the debate should ensure that they have, in fact, pressed the request to speak buttons. Thank you. And uh, also, I would advise at this time that there is sub-time in hand. And I now call in Patrick Harvey to open on behalf of the Scottish Greens. Uh, around six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I think uh, one or two members might already have mentioned uh, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation event yesterday under the, the title of Working Together to tackle poverty. And I, I have to say, I, I'm afraid I hope that whoever came up with that title hasn't been wasting their time listening to our debate so far, because a little over half an hour in, and it does kind of feel as though we all need our heads banging together. Working together has not been the theme or the tone of the debate so far. And I genuinely hope that changes, because Shirley Ann Somerville, as Cabinet Secretary, uh, and uh, also the new Secretary of State for Scotland spoke at that event and spoke about the need to respond to the real appetite and anger there is uh, a among a great many civil society organisations as well as people affected by poverty to have governments that do work together. Uh, and yet the first part of our debate has been characterised by finger pointing, not by any hint of self-reflection. And after yesterday's uh, launch event, which I uh, attended, I, I chatted to quite a few people uh, in the, the margins of that event. And overwhelmingly, there was a clear sense that the Scottish Government can and must do better, but also that the, UK government's, uh, the new UK Government's beginnings uh, have been uh, profoundly unimpressive certainly recognising the deeply harmful track record of nearly a decade and a half of Conservative austerity, but also underwhelmed uh, by the, uh, the sense of a, you know, the recognition that most governments like to under-promise rather than risk under-delivering, but a clear sense that the current UK government uh, appears determined to do both under-promise and under-deliver. 
I'm not at all surprised, uh, Presiding Officer, by uh, a Tory amendment today saying absolutely nothing about the effect of that decade and a half of austerity, or indeed a Tory speech blaming the left for the effects of the economic policies of the hard right. Uh, it's uh, it's des deplorable, but it's not at all surprising. What I am slightly surprised and certainly disappointed by is the fact that of the motion and amendments that are before us for a vote today, we're left only with the option of a one-sided position. A Scottish Government motion which points the finger solely at UK Government decisions uh, rather than any self-reflection about the Scottish Government's track record, and a Labour amendment which does the opposite, congratulating the UK Government, pointing the finger at the Scottish Government. This, this choice that's now left before us in what to, to unite behind as a Parliament is in stark contrast with that JRF theme of working together. We're left with those two choices. The Scottish Government's track record does include very significant measures to tackle poverty. The Scottish child payment has been described as a game-changer, a groundbreaking policy, and it deserves that credit, uh, as well as other measures, whether that's uh, smaller scale measures to tackle the cost of the school day, but, but which can still make a huge difference to individual families and households. Uh, free bus travel for more people in Scotland. Uh, the commitment to progressive taxation to pay for some of these measures to, to recognise, in fact, that we won't succeed in tackling poverty unless fundamentally we accept the need to redistribute wealth and a recognition that far too much uh, of this country's wealth is hoarded by a tiny number of people and businesses. But the UK government uh, track record also needs to be reflected on as well. The benefit cuts, the specific harmful policies, whether that's the two-child uh, two limit, the benefit cap, specific attacks on the most marginalised people in our society, with destitution used as a deliberate policy objective by the UK government. The track record of both governments needs to be reflected, but placing the blame, while necessary, is not sufficient. It's perfectly justified as a thing to do, as a political argument, but it cannot be an excuse for inaction. I give way. First Minister. I, I'm grateful to Mr Harvey for getting me. I think he knows me well enough to know that uh, I engage substantively on these issues. But the motion from the government today doesn't point the finger of blame. It calls for a policy change. It calls for a burden that Mr Harvey and I both know will cause damage to our fellow citizens to be reversed because there is no necessity for this policy decision to have been taken by the United Kingdom government. So, uh, while I hear what he says, I don't think it's a fair representation of what the government is putting to Parliament today, who were asking for people to come together and say to the United Kingdom, you've, government, you've taken the wrong course on this policy issue. Yeah. Patrick Harvey. And I hope it is clear that my criticism of the government motion is not a criticism of what is in it. And if it it's presented to Parliament unamended, of course I'm going to agree with what's in it. My criticism is of what is lacking in it, of what is missing from it. Any self-reflection uh, on the track record of the Scottish Government and the things that the Scottish Government can do as opposed to only what it can. Because the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament must use every power available. That case stands on its own merits, but it's all the stronger if we seek to convince the people of Scotland to take on more power and continue the journey towards self-government. So those additional measures that are urgently needed from, include from the, the Scottish Government reversing the harmful decisions on peak rail fares, on free school meals, cutting the cost of public transport compared with higher carbon modes of transport, making the heat and buildings programme the infrastructure investment for the country rather than a road building programme that's going to lock in high cost as well as high carbon modes of transport, fulfilling the promise of rent controls, funding all of these measures, uh, not just uh, from a, a redistribution of the, the capital budget, uh, but from continued steps toward progressive taxation. Less scope perhaps left to do that on income tax, but a huge opportunity to do it on local taxation, progressive local tax reform, which has stalled since the Butte House Agreement ended uh, and which the Scottish Government needs to pick up, as well as making progress toward a minimum income guarantee. Not something we can fulfil completely with the current powers, but the groundwork 
work can and must be laid. Presiding officer, I hope that in the, the years to come that we can expect more, a, a serious change of direction from the UK Government, but I am also determined to continue making the case that the Scottish Government can and must do more, even with the constraints that it faces in terms of power and in terms of budgets. Thank you, Mr Harvey. And I call on Alex Cole Hamilton uh, to open on behalf of the Scottish Liberal Democrats. Around six minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. I'm very happy to, to rise for the Scottish Liberal Democrats to speak to the motion before us. It is a short and carefully worded motion. I don't disagree with it at all, and I recognise the First Minister's comments some moment ago about it, just calling for a policy change that Liberal Democrats, as a matter of public record, support in terms of that change. But I would that we were debating a more expanded motion. I think it's a missed opportunity opportunity that in this challenge poverty week the first minister's motion didn't mention the lack of progress on this government's own child poverty targets or it didn't propose any solutions from the tools it has in its policy arsenal to move the needle on this vital topic the, this topic for which many of us have entered politics to resolve the First Minister should have lodged a motion that recognises the factors that create poverty in our society, uh, social immobility, health inequalities, poor housing, deficiencies in education. It diminishes the cross-party efforts, I think, in this chamber to tackle poverty in this most important milestone week to find the government lodge a motion that is so singular in focus. That said, I don't disagree with the sentiment. I do think that the Labour Party have got this wrong. The Scottish Government think that, these benches think that, and I dare say my colleagues in Scottish Labour think that, because household bill, uh, heating bills are set to rise again this winter. Nowhere will that be more keenly felt than in, in our Scottish communities, and particularly in the far north, in the remote and island communities of this country. And one of the first acts of the new Labour government was to remove that £300 winter fuel payment from millions of pensioners. The impact of this cut will be felt profoundly by many people across these islands. I fear it will cost lives. Major charities have spoken out against the cut, arguing it risks damaging the health of many older people. Caroline Abrams, the director of Age UK, said this move was reckless and wrong and spells disaster for pensioners on low and modest incomes. And remember, they have identified there are 800,000 pensioners who could be on pension credit and so exempted from the removal of the winter fuel payment, but are not for whatever reason. They are most likely to be impacted and plunge further into fuel poverty. So the decision to cut these payments is wrong. Labour do have choices on the winter fuel payment, on the DWP, chase, uh, um, on the DWP chasing carers for overpayments and on the two-child cap. Presiding officer, the MPs of my party were proud to walk through the lobbies of the House of Commons to oppose things like the two-child cap, side by side with Labour MPs. We also walked through the, those same lobbies with Labour MPs in support of the introduction of things like the winter fuel payment. So we share the disappointment that uh, many of the people in this country do. But they could make different choices. One option would be to reverse the Conservative cuts to the big bank taxes. That would raise in the region of £4 billion rather than punishing our pensioners to make up for the years of Conservative Party failure. The Scottish Government are not bystanders in this. They too have let down thousands of Scots when it comes to heating their homes. They have failed to tackle fuel poverty in Scotland. My goodness, they have failed and are delivering a real terms cut to that budget. Spending on energy efficiency programmes is set to be around £23 million less than it, would, than it would have been had ministers allowed that budget line to keep pace with inflation. Well, the fuel insecurity fund will go from £30 million last year to £0 in the 24-25 financial year. It's no wonder then that hundreds of thousands of Scots are living in real terms fuel poverty. Research by my party found that at the current rate of progress, and I intervened on the First Minister on this point, that the Scottish Government's Warm Home Scheme would take almost 100 years to insulate all eligible homes in Scotland. We need an insulation programme that is fit for purpose and meets the scale not just of the fuel poverty challenge, but of the climate challenge as well. And if we get this right, we can cut household energy bills and cut emissions at the same time. And, presiding officer, if they are to lose their winter fuel payment, then there is a sense in the Scottish Government schemes having a particular focus on pensioner fuel poverty. Let them be first in the queue. Franklin Roosevelt said that the test of our progress 
is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, it is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. As Liberals, we believe in giving people the opportunities to succeed and the tools to help themselves out of poverty. On health inequalities, where disability in this country still walks hand in hand with low income, where hundreds of thousands of Scots are trapped out of work by poor physical and mental health. They can't get on in life while they wait years for operations to begin mental health treatment or even just to get assessed for the problems that keep them behind. Or for this government to take long COVID seriously. And remember, presiding officer, there are over 150,000 Scots who have been left behind by the government's myopia in this important topic. On education, where the entertainment gap has not closed at all in 15 years, and with it, the ladder of social mobility that education provides pulled up from the poorest kids. On housing, where people need a secure, warm home. We need to give our carers a fair deal because so many of them are struggling to make and meet, but they are so much of the solution to the crisis in our NHS. I welcome the First Minister's goal of eradicating child poverty and things like the child payment. Of course I do. It's why I am in politics, but he'll forgive me being somewhat sceptical given the fact the SNP's government has already had 17 years in power and the poorest Scots, particularly the poorest juvenile Scots, have very little to show for it. In conclusion, presiding officer, before politics, I was a youth worker. The work I uh, was engaged in was focused on inner city young people affected by disability, parental substance use, care experience, and most of all, affected by grinding poverty. That poverty was inexorably linked. It was inexorably linked to their ability to learn, to engage, form positive, productive interests. And in youth work, getting it right for every child was our watchword. But the the Shinari indicators measure that progress. But in that Shinari indicators, the last letter in that word is I. That's inclusion. No child who's held back by poverty can ever be fully included in our society. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Cole Hamilton. We will now move to the open debate. And I call Colette Stevenson to be followed by Tess White. Ms <coughs> Stevenson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful to the Poverty Alliance for coordinating Challenge Poverty Week again this year. And it is important that politicians reflect and recommit to tackling poverty this week. In the face of extremely challenging financial circumstances, the SNP Scottish Government is delivering billions of pounds of support to vulnerable households. And we recognise social security as a human right and the SNP Government is investing £6.3 billion on social security this year. This includes supporting around 325,000 children in low-income families through the game-changing Scottish Child Payment, a payment which is benefiting around 4,400 children in East Kilbride alone to the tune of half a million pounds per month. The Scottish Government is also spending over £90 million this year in discretionary housing payments, a decision which effectively scraps the Tory and now Labour bedroom tax in Scotland. And we can see the results of the actions of the SNP and Government. Poverty levels are much lower in Scotland than they are in England and Wales, and the modelling suggests that 100,000 children are being kept out of poverty this year due to Scottish Government actions. Recognising that there is still more to do, the First Minister is prioritising the eradication of child poverty. And given 85% of Social Security remains reserved to Westminster, we also need to see action from the UK Government. And one of Labour's first moves in Government, with no notice and no consultation, was choosing to scrap universal winter fuel payments, a move that will likely push more pensioners into poverty. Of course, it's not just pensioners that are at risk from Westminster policies. As part of their austerity agenda, the Tories introduced the two-child limit and rape clause, yet Labour is keeping this. The Child Poverty Action Group has estimated that over 100 children have been pulled into poverty every single day since Labour took office because they have kept that Tory cap. That is not change. It's the same old Westminster tune. Presiding officer, in 1997, 
Tony Blair promised that there would be no tuition fees under Labour. As soon as he got into Downing Street, he broke that promise. And we now see Labour governments charging student tuition fees of nearly £10,000 per year in England and Wales. Fast forward 27 years, just months before this year's general election, Keir Starmer challenged the last Prime Minister to rule out cutting winter fuel payments. And as soon as he got into Downing Street, Keir Starmer decided that the Labour government will take the payment away from millions of pensioners. Age UK described this as reckless and wrong, a disaster for pensioners on low and modest income. Labour's solution? Apply for pension credit. However, as Citizens Advice pointed out, pension credit is one of the most underclaimed benefits. In fact, Independent Age estimates that almost £2.5 million in pension credit goes unclaimed every year by over 1,000 pensioner households in East Kilbride alone. And on top of that, pension credit only tops up total weekly income to around £11,000 per year for single pensioners or just over £17,000 for a couple. President Officer Keir Stammer has had 18 grand's worth of free football tickets in the past 12 months. Yet he expects two pensioners earning less than that between them to be able to get by without their winter fuel payment. During the election campaign, Labour also promised to lower people's energy bills. Instead, just this month, household fuel bills have gone up by 10 per cent, or £149 on average. So most pensioners are facing the double whammy of higher bills and no winter fuel payment. The Daily Record reported last week that Labour MSPs are frustrated with new Scottish Labour MPs for voting to cut winter fuel payments. So I wonder, presiding officer, whether those Labour MSPs will do the right thing today and support uh, the Scottish Government's motion calling on the UK Government to reverse its decision. So in concluding, the UK Government must introduce an essentials guarantee for universal credit and they must scrap the two-child cap they must also reverse the introduction of means testing for the winter fuel payment. I hope Scotland's Parliament will unite to agree on this and that the Labour government marks Challenge Poverty Week, not with warm words, but by reinstating universal winter fuel payment so that we can protect our pensioners. Thank you, Ms Stevenson. I now call Tess White to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Ms White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Conservatives are calling on both the UK and SNP governments to show some common sense and work together to deliver for all those affected by poverty. And to be clear, we do not support the cut to winter fuel payments imposed on pensioners by Labour and the SNP. It is a betrayal of thousands of vulnerable people in Scotland trying to heat their homes. As senior Labour politicians accepted thousands of pounds worth of freebies, it truly beggars belief that struggling pensioners have been left out in the cold by Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves. In Scotland's colder climate and longer winter, unnecessary deaths loom large on the horizon because of a political decision. The Scottish Government could have mitigated against Labour's decision, but chose not to. Instead, up to 900,000 pensioners in Scotland could lose out on a lifeline payment because the SNP choose to replicate Labour's cuts in full. They did have a choice and they chose not to, and that's, that is important. It's shameful. It's shameful that the SNP is using today's motion to try to leverage this issue for electoral advantage in today's motion. But it's not remotely surprising at all. And Anasawa's whataboutery and sticking plaster solutions 
will do little to reassure pensioners trying to make ends meet in a cost of living crisis. They have been failed by Anasawa and Labour. They have been failed by John Swinney and the SNP. As we mark Challenge Poverty Week 2024, a new report from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation is clear that the UK and Scottish governments are failing to use their powers to reduce poverty. Its new report, Poverty in Scotland 2024, lays bare the extent of the challenge. More than one in five Scots are currently living in poverty. And according to the JRF, there has been little meaningful progress in reducing these figures in recent years. We've heard woefully little from the SNP about the path pathways into poverty. There isn't a common sense solution in sight in today's motion, which is why the Scottish Conservative Amendment highlights the high quality healthcare, education and employment opportunities. Surely, presiding officer, the motion could have offered politicians at the heart of the SNP government an opportunity to demonstrate what policies are in place to tackle these issues and which devolve levers it will use to deliver them. What about drug deaths? People in the most deprived areas in Scotland are more than 15 times as likely to die from drugs compared to people in the least deprived areas. And it's Scotland's national shame. What about the housing crisis? Homelessness in Scotland is at its highest level in more than a decade. Rough sleeping has gone up. More children are living in temporary accommodation, not less. What about the 8,200 people in Scotland at the end of life who die in poverty every year? And then they, there are the prohibitive public transport costs impacting work commutes, the closure of vital community amenities because of council cuts, the parents struggling to meet childcare costs so they can keep working, and the families who can't cover the cost of school meals. All of this, presiding officer, falls within the Scottish Government's control. It can decide how it spends its budget, it sets the policy. But the SF SNP have been far too preoccupied with blaming others to use the powers that they have to tackle poverty. Even Social Security Scotland will take a full decade to devolve all benefits under the Scotland Act 2016. The SNP have missed the 2020 transfer deadline by six years. That's six years, and you, you put your heads down, and I would put your heads, my heads down in shame if I heard that. Today was an opportunity for the SNP to build consensus and discuss the very real challenges Scotland, Scotland faces to overcome poverty. It's a source of deep regret that they failed to provide any solutions in their motion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms White. I now call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Pam Duncan Glancy. Mr McMillan. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, first of all, the, the Poverty Alliance described Challenge Poverty Week as, and I quote, an opportunity for you to raise your voice against poverty and unite with others in calling for a just and equal Scotland. And to do this, we need to have an open and honest conversation about the variety of factors affecting poverty and how governments at all levels must play their part. Now, looking at, the, at my own Greenock and Inverclyde constituency, deprivation, health inequalities, along with economic challenges, are well documented. This is why, when I was listening to Russell Finlay's uh, opening comments earlier on, when he, he, he said he spoke about deep-rooted poverty and uh, generation after generation after generation of poverty. I'd like to gently remind Mr Finlay about uh, him and his colleagues about the actions of his party from 1979 onwards that decimated many communities across Scotland, uh, working, class, oh, two seconds, working class communities across Scotland, particularly in Inverclyde, the, in, which is part of the region uh, that Mr Finlay actually represents. And I'll take the intervention. Rachel Hamilton. Uh, to Stuart McMillan for taking the intervention. Presiding officer, Save the Children say that the Scottish Government's programme for government has done nothing to shift the dial on child poverty. Would Stuart McMillan agree? Stuart McMillan. So I'll come back to the point that Mr Finlay said. Generation after generation after generation. So if we do really seriously want to actually tackle the issue of poverty, we have to first of all accept and appreciate 
the actions of politicians of the past and how they have affected the politicians and the decision making of today. Now, looking at my own constituency, uh, I, uh, every single day, every single week uh, as a local MSP, uh, I deal directly with constituents who are living in poverty or who are engaging in, and are doing engagements in debates like this one today. And sometimes it is attending parliamentary events or, or ones taking place in my own Greenwich and Inverclyde constituency. But sometimes it is having meetings with charities, businesses and public sector organisations to discuss how they are working to try to help alleviate poverty. Now, tackling poverty is everyone's business. But there is no getting away from the fact that politicians and governments have the biggest role to play in addressing the root causes of poverty. And as elected representatives, we design, influence and vote on policies which impact upon every aspect of people's lives. Now, some of these decisions are easier to make than others, and particularly when this Parliament is faced with a finite budget and do not have the full control of powers affecting Scotland. Now, regardless I firmly believe that the new UK Labour government are fundamentally wrong to have chosen to remove the universality of the winter fuel payment. Mm -hmm. now, this will push more pensioners into poverty and it will do nothing to get the economy back on track. Now, plus, with Scotland experiencing colder winters than the rest of the UK, the harm caused by this policy will have a disproportionate effect upon pensioners who live in Scotland. Now, consider the briefing that Independent Age circulated before today's debate. In Scotland, the fuel poverty rate is highest amongst those of pension age, with more than one in three in fuel poverty. And the briefing goes on to say that, and I quote, older people are most likely uh, to uh, say it again, older people are, uh, are most vulnerable to the impacts of cold homes, are most likely to suffer respiratory and cardiovascular disease as a result. They also go on to say this can ultimately result in the premature death of those who cannot stay warm at home and is seen in the excess mortality rates amongst older people in winter. Saying also, given that Inverclyde has an ever-increasing older population, the decision to means test the winter fuel payment will be hugely damaging for my constituents. Independent age research indicates that 1,168 pensioners in Inverclyde, which equates to 15 per cent of the local pensioner population, are estimated to live in poverty. That is an estimated £3.6 million in pension credit going unclaimed annually in my constituency by 1,590 pensioner households. Now, given pension credit is now a qualifying benefit for the winter fuel payment, this means there are even more millions of pounds that pensioners in my area are entitled to but are missing out. Many, I, mean, I am determined to do all that I can as local MSP to encourage greater take up a pension credit in the constituency. I have undertaken many cost of living surgeries over the last 18 months. I am doing another one uh, on Friday uh, to mark Challenge Poverty Week. I am also going to be working with Independent Age to organise a surgery specifically aimed at pensioners, particularly with that aspect of increasing the take up. Uh, I know that housing was the, the first theme of the Poverty Alliance that they chose to, to focus on with regards to Challenge Poverty Week. And under the SNP, uh, 2,511 affordable and social homes have been built in Inverclyde, investment that was desperately needed. And since coming to power in 2007, this SNP government has introduced several measures to improve the availability of housing in Scotland, including the abolition of Margaret Thatcher's right to buy, uh, ending fixed-term private lets and improving tenants' rights. There are many more aspects as well. But, presenting officer, in closing, Labour have spoken of change. We have heard that often enough in the Chamber and also outside. Uh, but Labour are committed, they are committed to continuing the austerity agenda in Scotland, retaining, retaining the cruel Tory policies such as the two child cap uh, and also the bedroom tax. Mm -hmm. Anna Sarwar has to answer for that. So yet, uh, while more out of touch Westminster politicians focus on getting their suits and their glasses and other items paid for by wealthy benefactors, uh, you might want to listen to this, Mr O'Kane. Uh, well, this is happening. Many pensioners, many pensioners will sit at home, freezing this winter, worried, worried about whether they will see another day. Uh, thank you, Ms McMillan. I now call Pam Duncan Glancy to be followed by George Adam. Ms Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And this week and every year, we in this chamber highlight the many ways that poverty impacts our constituents' lives and debate our ideas for the solutions to it, because, Presiding Officer, there is little more important than addressing it. 
As we reflect on that this year, I'd like to start my contribution by thanking the thousands of people who worked tirelessly to bring about an end to poverty and to people suffering in Scotland. Organisations like the Child Poverty Action Group, the Poverty Alliance, Bernardo's, Aberlour, close the gap, of course, reminding us that poverty is a gendered issue, and the many other organisations working across Scotland who dedicate their lives to lifting people out of poverty. And with 19% of people in Glasgow being income deprived, I'd also like to pay a special thanks to the countless organisations in Glasgow who work day in and out in the region to support them, like Govan Help, the Glasgow Citizens Advice Bureau, Glasgow Disability Alliance and many more. They all have an enormous job to do and I thank them all for what they do. Zayn Officer, Glasgow gives just a snapshot of the scale of the problem because poverty levels across Scotland are scandalous. One million of our neighbours, friends and families live in poverty, thousands of them children, 30,000 more of them are living in poverty today than were in 2007 when this government came to power. That's one million people in Scotland blighted by poverty, in some cases by destitution, their health worse and their education outcomes suffering because they don't have enough money. And bluntly, presiding officer, this government is not doing nearly enough. Disabled people, young people, lone parents, black and minority ethnic families are all more likely to live in poverty. But we hear little of them in, from the government benches or the motion today. Presiding officer, reducing poverty in the long term means action for all of society across all of the themes of Challenge Poverty Week and in many policy areas that this government has control over, including ending the housing and homelessness emergency, improving health and education outcomes, making transport more accessible and affordable, supporting people into work and creating good, well-paid jobs in all parts of our country. But in so many of these areas, we see the SNP fall badly short. Rather than supporting people through a cost of living crisis and over winter with energy bills, they have scrapped the fuel insecurity fund, decoupled Scottish winter heating payments from cold weather, leaving people losing out on the coldest days, raided energy efficiency budgets, cut the affordable homes budget, failed to end care charges, scrapped the paid fares trial, cut the Scottish welfare fund in real terms and abandoned their promises to young people, including on free school meals. I'll give way to Kevin Stewart. Um, I, I thank, Kevin Stewart. I, I, think, I thank Ms Duncan Glancy for giving way, and I think in all of these issues uh, we want to do more. Uh, and I have to say that, like many, uh, uh, we were hopeful f uh, for some change from this Labour government, but that hasn't happened. <coughs> During the course of the election campaign, Anna Sarwar said, read my lips, no more austerity under Labour. Yet the cut to winter fuel payments is austerity. Can Ms Duncan Gladsey understand that and what will she do to have that cut reversed? Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy President Officer, and I'll certainly take absolutely no lessons from this government on austerity, because all of the actions that are holding people in Scotland in poverty and back are at the hands of this SNP government. They have powers and responsibilities to act, and they're holding people back none more so than children in Scotland. I'll take the intervention from this member. Thank, uh, Alistair Allen. I thank the member for giving way. I'm sure she's going to come round to this subject, but does she or does she not agree with the UK government's decision on payments for pensioners in the winter? Pam Duncan Clancy. I thank the member for that contribution, and I will, of course, come to that. There are no more than children in Scotland who are seeing their attainment drop and their poverty gap widen. Presiding officer on child poverty, this government's defining mission, we see stark consequences of their inaction and broken promises, denying young people the opportunities they deserve. And it's not for a shortage of incredible work going on in schools and communities, but the reality is we still see teachers and third sector groups stepping in to provide supplies, pencils and even food for young people they work with. Presiding officer, they shouldn't have to do this. Organisations, teachers, schools, all all have a role, of course, but they shouldn't have to go into their own pockets to lift children out of poverty because this government didn't step up. And rather than step up, the government has stepped back. When teacher numbers are going backwards, this government has stepped back and said it's not their fault. When key anti-poverty programmes like MCR pathways are cut, the government has failed to step in. And on countless promises they made, young people have been broken, even when this parliament intervened and set, told them to stick their, to, st to their promises and keep them. They stepped back and ignored it, all because of their financial incompetence. And that means they don't stick by anything they promise they'll do. We've seen promises on the, from the, the First Minister himself on scrapping school meal debt not come to fruition. 
Presiding officer, the impact of all of this is stark. Attainment down and the gap widening. There is a class ceiling on this government's watch on opportunity, and it doesn't stop there. The problem of poverty is widespread, and in challenge poverty of all weeks, I'd have expected the government to know that. We on these benches will work with the government if they're prepared to understand the extent of the levers they have. Yet today, in this year's debate, they've chose to ignore the scale of the problem and their role in addressing it, and have instead chosen political point scoring in their motion. President officer, it frustrates me every single day to see them squander opportunities to fix the real problems we face in Scotland, because they're more focused on what they can't do than what they can do. Can I get my time back, Presiding Officer? Yes, you can. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll take the interview. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you. I was just wondering when the member was going to get to the point that Kevin Stewart raised about whether she actually backs the UK government's decision to uh, scrap the winter fuel payment universality. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the member for that intervention, and we have set out quite clearly what our position on this is, and we will set quite clearly what our position we will set out quite clearly what our position on this is at decision time. The Labour government has announced, as part of this, the extension of the household support fund, which will see Scotland receive an estimated £41 million in Barnet consequential funding. With that money, the government could re-establish the fuel and security fund and provide an additional £200 for a 200. Thousand low-income households in Scotland. The government has a choice. It can support Scottish Labour's plan to get the money to people who need it. They can commit to use the funding for a package of support for people struggling, or it can focus on what it can't do. They can work today across governments and across local authorities to deliver targeted grants and energy top-up vouchers through local authorities in the third sector and support Scots who need it the most. Alongside a campaign to, of course, encourage uptake of social security payments, including on pension credits, it could ditch the zero hours contracts as positive destinations, reduce public transport costs, create jobs and sort waiting lists so that people don't have to raid their bank accounts to get health care. It can do all of this to maximise incomes and ensure we support people who need it the most in Scotland. The government have a choice, presiding officer. They can continue to let people down with their hand wringing and their whataboutery, or they can act, use the powers and resources they have, and deliver on their moral and legal duty to tackle poverty in Scotland. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you, Ms Duncan Clancy. I now call George Adam to be followed by Michael Mara. Mr Adam. Thank you, presiding officer. Initially, when I sat down to work out what I was going to say today, I stopped for a while to contemplate the best way forward. Normally, these debates can descend into party political rammies with more heat than actual solutions, and unfortunately, we seem to have gone down that way a bit here today as well. So I thought I'd take time not to add to that, but that in itself, presiding officer, can be challenging. The problem for me is that I've been here a long time and I may just repeat something I've said previously, and for others it can just become a sterile, very academic debate. That's always disappointing for me, as I always see this chamber as the heart and soul of Scottish political life. Not like some cold, calculating debating society, which it doesn't really matter which side of the argument you're on. For me, poverty, and in particular getting our people out of poverty, is one of the main issues affecting many of our constituents. But it is more than that to me and others in this chamber. It's about our own actual lives. Not many of you will be aware that not only am I from Paisley, but I'm from Fergusley Park in Paisley, and that area has had its challenges in the past. And like many areas in Scotland, it's been blighted by poverty for decades. Regardless of who was in power in Westminster, we had to work hard to struggle to get our, lives, our families ahead in life. And my dad's journey in this road was to work as a self-employed engineer and try and take his, power, his family out of poverty. There were many highs and devastating lows. There was good years, but they were probably outweighed by the very many bad years. We went from being comfortable to a family of being homeless and only helped out by the support of family members who let us stay with them or friends who allowed us to stay in their caravan holiday home for a year. So when poverty hits, presiding officer, it stays with you throughout your life. No matter how I manage to get on in life, I'm still that wee boy who was quite traumatic and chaotic lifestyle when he was growing up. For years, I've put this all thoughts to the back of my head because I'm from a generation you just don't talk about these kinds of things. But with that in mind, what really irritates me is we have a debate like this in this parliament and I have to listen to posh boys debate this in a very cold and calculating way. Yeah. This is people's lives we're talking about. People should not be talked down to by elected members. I'm not saying that you have to experience it to understand poverty, but what I am saying is there needs to be some compassion in the debate. 
Sometimes I listen to some of those in here and listen to things they say, and it drives me to absolute distraction. I can only think what those in the real world out there think when they hear some of these debates. During my life, it's not mattered who's been in power in Westminster. As for the majority of my life, this place did not exist. But it is Westminster that has created the many issues and challenges that we face in Scotland. And the sooner the Unionist parties accept that and take some responsibility, the further this debate will get on. Currently, the UK Labour government decision to embark on a brutal programme of further Westminster austerity, cutting winter fuel payments and is an absolute disgrace. And if Mr O'Kane wants to defend uh, the disgrace of the winter fuel payments getting taken away from pensioners, I'm quite happy to let him in. Paul O'Kane. I'm very grateful to Mr Adam uh, letting me uh, intervene on him. And he's making a case which I think many of us would recognise, particularly those of us who come from Renfrewshire, about the real challenges there have been in places like Fergusley Park. But is he really suggesting that a Labour government who lifted a million children out of poverty, who invested in a national minimum wage for the first time, in working tax credits and all the reformation that we saw in that period, did nothing to help people in Fergusley Park? George Adam. The last time the new Labour government lowered the, the, the amount so far that it would have been almost impossible for them to claim that they are doing that. This is about real people and real people's lives, not the fantasy that the Labour Party are currently talking about. Pensioners in Scotland are having to deal with whether they have to eat or heat their homes this winter. Now, that's an absolute disgrace. And that comes weeks after Labour in Scotland leader Anna Sarwar saying, read my lips, no austerity under Labour. I become quite passionate, as it's no surprise to anyone here, that I want independence for Scotland. I joined the SNP in 1987 as a very young man uh, because how the Tory government had devastated Paisley. Their economic vandalism tried to break the very heart and soul of my town. Then came New Labour. They never helped much either. They continue to go down the Westminster route, as they do now again by copying Tory austerity. Initially, I didn't want my children to grow up in a UK where Scotland was forgotten. And now I have grandchildren, and that's the future I want for them, as that of an independent Scotland. But what is happening at the moment is not change from the Labour Party. This is the continuity of Tory party's years of austerity. This is more of the same, making no difference in communities like mine, actually leaving it, making it even harder for them to work their way out of poverty. And that is where the actual money comes from, is Westminster. And if Mr O'Kane is once again happy to explain why he's left people in Remshire in poverty. He can now tell me. Paul O'Kane. I don't think I got an answer to the first point about the record of a Labour government in places like Renfrewshire, but this very week the Labour government will bring a bill to the House of Commons which will see a new deal for working people put on the statute book that will end fire and rehire, it will end the hours contracts, it will uh, repeal anti-trade union legislation, it will give people security at work. Surely he agrees that that is a change the people of Fergusley Park need. George Adam. Not if you're a pensioner in Fergusley Park and you can't put your heating on because of what the Labour Party has done. The basic idea here is you cannot attack a, a part of the community and then just say you're doing other things that are OK. This is important. This isn't some academic debate. This is people's lives we're de dealing with here. And I believe there are some in the Labour Party. I am not cynical enough. This place, presiding officer, has not made me cynical enough to actually think there are not those in the Labour Party who want to join me in this journey to actually try and make Scotland better. Let's talk about the big issues. Let's talk about how we can make Scotland better. The Building a New Scotland paper, Social Security and Independent Scotland, it's talked about take a human rights approach, uh, based approach, treating people with dignity, fairness and respect. Build a system that is an integral part of the wellbeing economy, deliver a financial security for all those with a minimum income guarantee. This is what I want to talk about, presiding officer. That's the future I want to debate about. I don't want to be sitting here and listening to some of the posh boys continue to argue as if this is just some debating society. This is Scotland's parliament. This is Scotland's future we're talking about. And it's about time we start moving towards that and talking about the real issues. Thank you, Mr Adam. I now call Michael Mara to be followed by Claire Adamson. Mr Mara. Thank you, President Officer. Today, Parliament gathers to challenge poverty, um, and we rightly challenge the inevitability of poverty in a politics that has become far too often without hope and where the very idea of progress is uh, often challenged. We can assert together that the shape of our society is ours to control. 
and that while people today may be victims of circumstances, they should not be captured by circumstances for their whole lives. Far less should generation after generation of families be captured by the circumstance of their birth. Breaking the bondage of poverty pay and deprivation is the founding principle of organised labour. We know that poverty is a function of the choices that we make in politics and, crucially, the choices that at times we refuse to make. Poverty is inhumane and the fight for a more equal country of dignity and equality is never done. Poverty will never be history alone. It is an argument to be re-won again and again. I actually thought George Adams set that out well. He and I, and Mr O'Kane on my side, may disagree about what happened after 1997. But he makes the case, I think, rightly, that the dial can move backwards as well as forwards. And we should always be conscious of that, because 1,080,000 people in Scotland live in poverty. That's 130,000 more than in 2007. 260,000 children live in poverty, 30,000 more than in 2007. That dial does move backwards as well as forwards. But today's government motion centres on the winter fuel payment, an active decision that was taken by the UK Labour government to means test a previously universal benefit. And that's a decision that the Chancellor did not wish to make. And I do understand the concerns that people have set out, and I've heard the concerns with on doorsteps and people around the country, but it is a decision that I support. And the concerns that we all share for those around the eligibility line is clear, and rightly so. We should be doing everything we can as a parliament, working together to make sure we can ensure that as few people uh, are the victims around that line, that we can make sure they receive the help that they need. That's absolutely critical. We do know that there are far too many people living in poverty in our country. And the question is whether the government wants that serious practical debate about what we can actually do to deal with the situation of poverty here in Scotland. So no one is claiming that the decision to means test winter fuel payment was an easy one. Far from it. But the UK government has taken that decision in the light of harsh economic realities. And those result from the reckless actions of the Conservatives in the dying days of their abysmal administration. The fiscal disaster of the UK finances is real. £22 billion of a black hole in this year. And the Chancellor was presented with the reality of that and had to act accordingly. It has to be dealt with. Yes, in the long run, that can be through growth, through stability and investment. I think we would all agree with much of that. But these are in-year financial adjustments that have to be made. We have to reset and adjust the public finances. And the First Minister started today by saying that he recognises and sympathises with that fiscal challenge. But I'm afraid that those words do not ring true unless he recognises some of the actions that are required to be taken to deal with the fiscal circumstances. Gladly. First Minister. I'm very grateful to Mr Mara, forgive me, because he, he alights on an important philosophical question about the management of the, of the public finances in year, where there are different choices to be made, where the Chancellor could change the fiscal rules under which she is prepared to operate. Now, I argued for that during the election because I knew the reality of the difficulties that we're facing, and I offered a solution of changing the fiscal rules to avoid some of the abrupt decisions that are being taken, such as this one, which will damage individuals. And Mr Mara and I both agree that it will damage individuals. Michael Mara. I, I think that the First Minister makes a reasonable point in terms of the, how we make those adjustments in years. But I would say to him that the circumstances that the Chancellor faced, would, if we were to make the kind of adjustments, £22, £22 billion pounds of in-year fiscal adjustments, is akin to the kind of action proposed by Liz Truss. To add, and I think that what the, what the First Minister is clearly suggesting within this and moving the fiscal rules is inherently that is about changing the borrowing in this country. So it's saying that in year that we should add an additional £22 billion. Now this is a government, we inherited the legacy of a government that time and again had breached the in year allowances that had been kept aside so that we could actually meet pay requirements and other, and other requirements in our economy and our public expenditure. And it's not reasonable, I don't believe, on behalf of what the, the First 
Minister says, to that we can act in that way, just to go to the markets, ask for more money, and regarding not taking the kind of difficult fiscal decisions, no, no thank you, let me, let if, you, if I can complete, if they, um, not taking the kind of reasonable but challenging fiscal decisions in year to address the spending on the side of it. The borrowing is not infinite. It simply isn't. And time and again I hear requirements from this side in the government that it, almost like it could be. Well, I'm afraid there are difficult decisions that have to be taken. And that's why we're coming to here today to offer a constructive uh, contribution to the debate. The UK government's decision to extend the household support fund is expected to deliver around £41 million in consequentials. That money is available to the government because the £160 million has not been removed yet. That is the reality of how the finances work, and I'm afraid that Mr Arthur knows that more than most. That money could be used to reinstate the Fuel and Security Fund, which was scrapped in the last Scottish Budget. And we also have to address the many other causes of poverty, and we can have, I think, common ground about so many of them. We have to make work pay, as Mr O'Kane set out so eloquently, and the SNP would agree, I hope, with that. We have to deal with housing, although we know that the affordable housing budget has been cut. We have to make sure that we can look and take action on the reform of education, where the gap between rich and poor is far, far too wide. We have to reform our justice system further. We have to reform addiction services. We have to deal with drug deaths that fall on the poorest in our society. And we have to rescue our NHS from what some people believe is terminal decline to ensure that people can get out to work and have the route out of poverty that so many people need. Thank you. I now call Claire Adamson to be followed by Miles Brigg around six minutes. Ms. Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I have spoken many times on Challenge Poverty Week in this chamber um, and I am very disappointed that the calls I have this year are pretty much exactly the same as previous and that is because we have no change in the new government. Back in 2019, the figures show that across Lanarkshire's seven Westminster constituencies, more than 6,500 families were affected by not receiving benefits for over 22,300 22, children because of the, the two-child tax limit. Both the Motherwell and Wisher, Coatbridge, Chrysler and Bells Hill constituency equated to 16% of children who lived there. And I, as Mr Adams so eloquently um, said, this is my constituency. This is children living in poverty in my constituency. And it was imposed... And it's something that Labour used to campaign against. Now, in government, Labour, Labour have voted to keep this and now have cut the winter fuel payment for, for pensioners. People did want change, but they've got a changeling. It looked like Labour, it sounded like Labour, but actually it's packed full of Tory austerity and Tory values. Yeah. Yes, I'll take a, a Michael Mara. Would Ms Adamson uh, agree um, that we are 13 weeks into a Labour government, that we are bringing forward legislation for a new deal for working people, and we haven't yet had a budget to actually make some of the really transformed decisions we, can, we, we hope for? Isn't it some generosity to say that change has started, but that there's great potential to change further? Clean Adamson. Well, unfortunately, Mr Mara, the first point that Labour has gone to for that £20, million, the £20 billion hole that they found, that everybody told them was there in the first yeah. place, was to put that burden on the poorest people, put it on the pensioners. What about taxing the rich? What about putting that burden on those with the broadest shoulders? That used to know I'm not taking another intervention. This is a Labour Party who used to value universalism. The party that introduced the National Health Service free at the point of use. The party that introduced child benefit as a universal benefit. And the Labour Party who introduced the um, universal state pension adopting the beverage report principles. Our pensioners are already poorly served by successive Westminster control. The OECD show that with the 11th highest retirement age of the 20 European countries that it studied and that we have the poorest pensions comparably to a lot of our European neighbours. So this is just not a sustainable position. 
In the analysis of the Institute of Fiscal Studies last week, it concluded that removing the two-child limit is the single most cost-effective policy for reducing the number of children living in below the poverty line. Social Security remains the most effective lever to lift children out of poverty. And I've heard today that we don't keep our promises. We have. We still have universal free prescriptions, universal free tuition. Yeah. We have universal support for, for um, uh, uh, childcare in the 1140 hours that we give to, to parents. Mm -hmm. And it really is beyond belief that I'm having to try and persuade Labour colleagues about the value of universalism and how we should be looking after those most vulnerable in our constituencies. This Scottish Government welcomes every single citizen in this country, welcomes them with the baby box. And at the same time, Labour have just turned round and forgotten those values of what universal benefit means. It's the values of our country and how we treat our citizens. And they've turned around and said to our pensioners that they are no longer valued in that way by bringing in uh, a means testing for, for the winter fuel payments. And Labour could also have looked at how our citizens in Scotland pay a higher standing charge than other people in the UK. We pay a higher standing charge than people in London. We have a colder climate than people in London. This will disproportionately affect Scotland's pensioners. Yeah. And I don't see that as being a value of a Labour Party that I have grown up alongside or that I remember. But I do see that while Westminster is making decisions for the people of Scotland, we are always going to be uh, disproportionately affected by those decisions and that the only way for us to fully reach our ambitions for the values we have for Scotland and for universalism is for us to have an independent country. I just want to finish, presiding officer, by saying this week I march out a uh, um, challenge poverty week in my constituency by hosting what we're calling the Community Action Network, bringing together all the organisations in our area that are helping people in poverty, from food banks, from the churches, to third sector organisations, people dealing with addictions, people dealing with um, people in recovery, people de dealing with families that are carers, have disabled people, bringing them all together to make difference in our communities and ensure we're all working together for that common purpose. And it would be really good if we could feel in this chamber that there are people here that with us want to make a better life for our citizens. Thank you. I now call Miles Briggs to be followed by Emma Roddick for around six minutes. Mr thank, Briggs. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And can I start by thanking the organisations who have provided very helpful briefings ahead of today's debate and also thank them uh, for the work which they are doing, charities across our country, uh, to challenge poverty. And I think that is important. We note their uh, work uh, this week. And I very much welcome today's debate because I think it is a, rightly an opportunity to put on record serious concerns for the impact that the removal of winter fuel payment will have on older citizens, citizens across Scotland, especially as we head into uh, winter and the decisions which people will be taking now over uh, fuel payments, for example, for people living in fuel poverty, especially those living off-grid, households across rural communities, this will have a, a severe impact. And I already know from speaking to people, these decisions are being taken today. And this is a double whammy for ma many people in rural communities. People living in fuel poverty in Aviemore, in Braemar, in Aboyne, have seen a cut of £100 from the winter he heating payment they had last year from this SNP government and they are now likely to see a cut of between £200 and £300 from this Labour government. But politics is about choices and we need to be honest that this decision by the UK Labour government will cost lives. This is an essential benefit and should be restored to prevent avoidable de deaths, as many have spoken about already. This week, uh, last week, the Scottish Daily Telegraph newspaper published an FOI which revealed that the Scottish Government had also not undertook any specific assessment of how many additional deaths this would cause, as the Labour Government have not done either. And I had said earlier in my intervention on the First Minister 
Ministers have opportunities and options to try to make sure this doesn't progress this year. And it, yeah, if I can get some time back, yes. Keith Brown. Uh, can I thank Kamal Briggs for taking intervention? Can I ask him whether the UK Government undertook any analysis of the number of deaths that were caused during the energy crisis by the UK Government's failure, unlike other governments, to get on top of that crisis in support of people struggling to pay their bills? Miles Briggs. Well, I think that's a complete rewriting of history. The member will be aware of the £400 heating payment he and everyone else across the country yeah. will have received from the UK Government. Real action in difficult times, not cuts like we're seeing from the Labour Government now. But we need to look at what can be done and I think that's where I've been as constructive as I can with ministers in putting forward where they have the opportunity to defer the block grant adjustment on this winter fuel payment this year so that ministers can make that payment and that would present an opportunity for people across Scotland to continue to benefit from that payment. I hope it's something ministers will genuinely go away and look at because there's an option there which they can take forward. But this has also presented an opportunity, this debate today, to look at other groups who will be impacted. Uh, one group which have not been mentioned so far are kinship carers and unpaid carers. Now, the nature of kinship care is often that these are grandparents and retired individuals caring for young people, um, in many cases caring uh, beyond um, anything we would ask. But they will also be impacted by this, and it's something we need to make sure is taken into account. Carers Scotland report, for example, showed greater levels of poverty and financial insecurity uh, for unpaid carers across Scotland, with more than a quarter of carers, 28%, and 41% of carers in receipt of carers' allowance struggling to make ends meet. And I think it was important, which both, um, the point which both Alex Cole Hamilton and Stuart McMillan made with regards to those not claiming pension credit. It is critical now that we do see that uh, take up encouraged and for all of us across the chamber in whatever opportunities we have to to encourage low-income households to claim that pension credit and therefore to unlock in the future um, access to the winter heating payment as well or fuel payment i think that's something which today and i hope the government channels which are available um, will be looking at doing all they can as well but we need to also make sure that this is not a policy people um, forget about. This Labour government, after just three months, have taken this decision. It is clear that they were not honest with the people of the United Kingdom at the general election. At no point did they mention there was... Yes, I will. Michael Myra. Some level, presiding officer, a real hard neck on this basis, given the financial legacy that was left, when the OBR have said that the scale of the cuts were not displayed to them in terms of the, the, the black hole in the finances that are left by the Tories. And maybe the members over here don't understand it, but this was a £22 billion in-year black hole, not the £20 billion structural deficit that his party created. It was in-year. That's what the Chancellors had to deal with. Miles Briggs, I can give you the time back. Th thank you, Deputy President Officer. The member fails to say that this includes all the pay deals which the Labour government have signed up to as well. That is the truth of this. And there's a simple fact here. I, I don't think I'll have time to. There's a simple fact here, very briefly. Daniel Johnson, briefly. So is the member saying that the pay body, pay award body, should be disregarded in the future? Is that his position? No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying Labour people, Labour politicians need to be honest with this. This yeah, is their yeah, black hole. Absolutely. There's no one else's. Yeah. And the members are not in opposition now. They need to maybe wake up to that yeah. fact. These are Labour Party decisions. Yeah. This is Labour's mess alone. Yeah. Yeah. And we will see, I believe, the Labour Party pay a huge price in 2026 when pensioners across Scotland are given the opportunity to pass their judgment on this decision as well. To conclude, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, if I no, get some no. time, <laughs> no more time back. So, um, to conclude, this is going to have huge impacts. And one aspect which I wanted to touch upon, the, the First Minister mentioned uh, work on a social tariff. I really welcome that and hope that there can be cross-party involvement on that very issue. Chaz and others have been looking towards this. The, the uh, fuel poverty campaigner Carolyn Hunter and I are trying to take forward a round table. So although the First Minister doesn't look like he's listening to this side of the chamber, I hope he is willing to uh, include all cross-party involvement in that. Um, finally, I support the amendment in Russell Finlay's name. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr Briggs. I now call Emma Roddick to be followed by Keith Brown uh, around six minutes. Ms Roddick. Well, presiding officer, there's a lot to unpack here in, in just six minutes. 
Um, Anna Sarwar, in his opening speech, reminded us four or five times that we have been in power for 17 years as opposed to three months of a UK Labour government. And I think that is a very important point because the UK government has only been in power for three months and what a lot they have managed to do in those three months to Scottish pensioners. Three months is barely enough time for a government to do a detailed impact assessment on pulling money out of the heating the homes of pensioners, so it is no surprise then that we still do not have one. People of pension age are the group most likely to experience fuel poverty, and my region, the Highlands and Islands, has the highest levels of fuel poverty in the UK. The decision to cut the universal winter fuel payment was not only taken against the best interests of the Highlands and Islands, it was taken without sparing a thought for the Highlands and Islands. Because surely, if the Labour government knew that it was sentencing my constituents to a harsh winter without even as much support as the last Conservative government, which is the government that introduced the two-child cap, a terrifying review of disability benefits, it would surely have thought twice, assessed the potential impacts, engaged with the Scottish Government and older people's organisations, and then taken the correct decision to keep people warm and alive. I will take an intervention. Miles Briggs. I thank the member for taking this intervention. Um, her constituents in Abbey Moor have also lost out under the Scottish Government's changes to winter heating payments. Does she believe that's something which they need to look again at as a government? Um, currently, someone would receive a payment of £58.75. Uh, last year, they would have received three times that. So is that something the Scottish Government will look at? Emma Rodder can give you the time back. Thanks to the Scottish Government's changes to that payment, my constituents in Avi Moore will know year on year what support they can expect, rather than it being based on a weather station which doesn't necessarily tell you what the situation is within their household. Now, sadly, however generous you want to be about the ignorance of the Labour government as to what this decision meant when it was first announced, there is now no chance that Keir Starmer does not know what he has done, because he has experts, members of the public, people of all political parties, including his own, telling him every day. People are angry, and maybe Labour politicians assume that this will all be forgotten by the time of the next election, but they are wrong. Every winter will be a reminder to people up and down this country, from yeah. the pensioners who are shivering at home to the third sector organisations who are coming up with ever more creative ways to provide heat at low cost, that UK Labour prioritises showing off to oil and gas companies to actually making sure that people can stay warm inside their houses. Now, I have a lot of respect for many Scottish Labour colleagues to my right, particularly those who are that not that far to my right, and it's quite painful to hear some of them apparently genuinely unable to state when questioned directly whether they think this decision to take money away from pensioners to heat their houses was wrong. Of course it was wrong, and I hope some of them will have the guts to oppose this decision loudly and help the SNP in our calls to the Labour government to reverse this cut in the forthcoming budget and to introduce a social tariff that does stand a chance of targeting support to those who need it most with their energy bills. And I say to them, as a socialist, Labour's change cannot just mean a harsher welfare system than the Tories. Do not become, as Unite's General Secretary Derek Thompson has described them, just as culpable as UK Labour for these harsh, unnecessary choices. Now, Anna Sarwar complained about the focus on the winter fuel payment, and he's right that poverty is not made or solved by one government action. But I remember standing on the front bench during a similar debate last year, decrying that an incoming Keir Starmer government looked set to uphold the two-child cap, ditch universal benefits, threaten tuition fees, and fail to take action on rising energy costs, to calls and shouts from the Labour benches that it was nonsense. Well, never mind reading my lips, read Keir Starmer's press releases. Austerity is here under Labour. There are some things that I do agree with Labour on today. I agree that there is work that needs to be done on housing, education, on social security when we have further powers to tackle poverty in Scotland. 
And I stood here last week and said you can't tackle poverty without tackling homelessness. I spent this morning in committee discussing capital investment in housing and how that's necessary for the same journey. And I agree with all of that, and I will always say so. But progress on those devolved matters is why poverty levels are 10% lower in Scotland than they otherwise would have been, and why an estimated 100,000 children are not living in poverty today. It is shameless, hypocritical and completely contrary to evidence to turn up to this Parliament and defend a new government coming in and cutting welfare budgets, ramping up austerity and removing fiscal opportunities from the Scottish Government, all the while claiming that the reason the people they've taken money from this winter are going hold is the SNP. The SNP is the reason that £3 billion is being spent this year to directly support vulnerable households. The SNP is the reason that the families of over 30,000 children last year got a child heating payment. The SNP is the reason that disabled people can now access social security in this country through a system that treats them with dignity, fairness and respect. Now, I am here to tackle poverty, and I know that's true for people across this chamber. And I've agreed in the past when Labour colleagues have come to me and said, this isn't good enough. I worked with those Labour MSPs on period poverty, on the rent freeze, on disabled people's poverty, because we are here for the same reason. So I say to them today that this is not good enough. UK Labour's decisions since its election in July are not good enough. Leaving pensioners cold and trampling over devolution is not good enough. So please join us in telling UK Labour to get it right. Thank you. I now call Keith Brown to be followed by John Mason uh, at the six minutes. Mr Brown. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I, I don't think the debate has quite really reached the level it should have, given how important and profound the issue is that we're discussing. I think in particular some of the contributions from Labour and Conservative contributors really give you an absolute definition of post-truth politics. Both Tory and Labour are reading from the same playbook, and that is to punish and cut funding to devolved administrations and then to attack them for the inevitable consequences of the cuts that they have caused in the first place. And this kind of politics is both tawdry and, in my view, Trump-like. I, I think that the, if you look at the title of this, if you look at the theme of the week, Challenge Poverty, you have to ask yourself questions. How does the two-child cap challenge poverty? In what way does it challenge poverty? How does the bedroom tax? We used to hear about the bedroom tax an awful lot in this chamber. I know Jackie Bailey is just coming back into the chamber. We used to hear it from Jackie Bailey on a regular basis. We've heard nothing about it since the Scottish Government's made sure that people in Scotland are protected from it, but it still exists in the rest of the UK. And if they were to get rid of that, it would produce a benefit for people in Scotland. But we hear no more about the bedroom tax. How does the bedroom tax challenge poverty? How does the rape clause challenge poverty? These are things which the Labour Party is committed to keeping. How, how does it uh, help poverty if we have £150, £160 million pounds cut in the Scottish Government's budget with 90 minutes' notice? Now, I have not seen any single Labour member give a defence to the First Minister's question, which was, do you support that? Do you think that is the way to conduct business between a UK Government and devolved administration? A sudden huge cut in the budget within the year, within, within 90 minutes of the decision being taken. In what way does that pay any kind of respect to the kind of parliament this was meant to establish under Donald Dewar? And I'll take Michael Mara if you'll be brief. Uh, Michael Mara, I, I appreciate the member giving way, because that's just not how it works. An in-year adjustment happens in the next reconciliation. The money doesn't get taken out of the bank account. It's still there for the rest of this year. The question now is to how that might be profiled over years to come. That's a choice that they can make. It's, there's a, that is just not the case. I understand, Brown, I, can the give the time back. I understand the point that £160 million will have an effect next year. It will mean that people will not get the benefit that we're talking about next year. I realise that's the point. But do you accept, do you support the UK Through government... Through the chair, taking, please. Does, does the member support the UK government taking the decision it did in the way that it did? And surely, if Labour have any pretensions, and let's face it, they're falling like snow off a dike, any pretensions to be the government in this place in 2026, they have to at some stage show they're standing up for people in Scotland. And if they were, they would condemn that cut from the UK government. Yeah. Not a word on the 150 million from the Labour Party. Yeah. And how does increasing the cost of energy by 10% 
overnight uh, when they professed they were going to do exactly the opposite, help people challenge poverty in this country. Now, when I asked Alice Samar about that, he said, well, that's nothing to do with us. That's off, Jim. I have screeds of quotes from Labour people condemning the Tory government when they said it was off, Jim, that were doing it, not them. Of course, it's a Labour government that's yeah. increased that uh, money that come, comes um, on top of people already hard-pressed. And it was an Iron Bevan that said that politics is the language of priorities. What are Labour's priorities? You could cut the £100 billion or so going towards Trident, the renewal of Trident. You could choose to do that. That is an option that you have. That's a difficult decision, but you're saying that you're willing to take Through the chair, decisions. please. So there are choices that can be made, and you have cho the Labour Party has chosen to make the choice of going after, as some people have pointed out, the poorest people in society. Now, again, I challenged uh, Anis Sauer previously to say that Labour know people in Scotland are going to die because of this measure. They know that because they've done the research. So I'm asking how many people in Scotland will die? And that was before the 10% increase in energy costs. Now, you condemn the Conservatives for doing it before. Will you say how many people are going to die because of this cut? I think it's really important that we understand the effect of what's happening here. And surely we must have a better prospect here in Scotland than the perpetual austerity that we get under the UK. And that means the perpetuation of poverty as well. The two things go hand in hand. It doesn't even work. The Tories started austerity because they wanted to get a grip of public spending. They've just left office with two and a half trillion pounds of debt, over 100 per cent of GDP. They've completely failed even on that measure. And I have to say, for Paul O'Kane to accuse Russell Finlay of cognitive uh, di dissonance, listen to this quote from Labour's, Labour's own amendment. We recognise the need to support vulnerable people uh, through the winter with energy bills. That's what Labour is. That's not cognitive dissonance. That's utter hypocrisy, yeah. given the cut that you just agreed. Now, it's the case, of course, as Patrick Harvey says, the Scottish Government's got to challenge itself for what it's done. But I think the record, we've heard it already from Emma Roddick, no tuition fees. If you're, I had a programme Radio 4 this week, the, the burden of £70,000, £80,000, £90,000 that people are having to deal with as a result of having gone to university in England and Wales. No tuition fees in Scotland. Free prescriptions. And that's most important to those who can't afford them. Uh, also, we've heard about the child care payments as well, but most of all, the child payment, a very, sta a very earnest statement of intent to say we intend to try and tra uh, tackle child poverty. No other, no other uh, government has done that. No other parliament has done that. It's been called a game changer, but it's, leave that aside. Just think of the individual families that are getting that money every week that weren't getting it before. The difference that makes to them in terms of buying food for their kids, clothes for their kids, especially in the winter time. Maybe not enough to put on the heat and give them what Labour's doing to people, but certainly a big help to people in this country. So I think the Labour Party have to really look at themselves. And I think Emma Roddick is right. There are people not, unfortunately, for whatever reason, uh, uh, I'm sure they're perfectly legitimate reasons, not in the chamber today, who I would love to have heard from on the Labour benches, because I know they're concerned about this. And this, I would just say to them, this is the time to register that concern. This is the time to let the UK government and Rachel Reeves know this is not the thing to do. This is going to have people dying, both in Scotland and the UK, and this is your chance to show you're opposed to that. So I would encourage them to vote with the government and with the First Minister's motion. Thank you, and I call the final speaker in the open debate, John Mason, around six minutes, please. Hey, thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to take part in this debate marking Challenge Poverty Week. This morning, the Finance Committee considered the national performance framework, and one of the outcomes is poverty, with the vision being, we are committed to eradicating poverty and hunger in Scotland, we are addressing the links between poverty and income, housing, ethnicity, gender, health, disability and age. Our achievements, potential and life choices are not decided at birth or by class or background. We are all able to enjoy financial security, have a decent job, home and a good life. So I think we're actually all signed up to this commitment. And it does also tie in with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which are relevant. A, one itself, number one, no poverty, two, zero hunger, five, gender equality, seven, affordable and clean energy, ten, reduced inequalities, twelve, responsible production and consumption. Now, others have already mentioned some of the stark figures, but I wanted to just add a few as well. 60% of working-age adults in poverty and 70% of children in poverty lived in a household where someone was in paid work between 2020 and 2023. The youngest households in Scotland are more likely to be in poverty in 2020 to 23 
39% of households where the head of the household was aged between 16 and 24 were in poverty higher than older aged households. In 2018 to 23, people from non-white minority ethnic groups were more likely to be in relative poverty after housing costs compared to those from the white British and white other groups. The poverty rate was 50% for the Asian or Asian British ethnic groups and 51% for the mixed black or black British and other ethnic groups. And attempts have certainly been made to tackle some of these figures by successive Scottish governments, including free school meals, the Scottish child payment, more generous adult disability payment, no university tuition fees and free prescriptions as finances have allowed. Of course, all of these measures cost money and I commend attempts to raise more in income tax by the SNP and the Greens. Personally, I think we need to go further and get more into line with countries like Denmark and France where tax as a proportion of GDP is higher. However, I do accept that with close neighbours with low tax rates, it is difficult to have too great a tax differential, whether we are independent or not. Can I just in passing mention the international scene, which I think has not been mentioned today, and where pov the poverty situation is considerably worse? The United Nations definition of extreme poverty is living on less than $2.15 per day, or $785 per year. And yet, even with that incredibly low bar for extreme poverty, some 712 million people, one in 11 globally, are below that. Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest rate of children living in extreme poverty, reaching 40% in 2022. Nearly 90% of children living in extreme poverty reside in either Sub-Saharan Africa or South Asia. At the same time, there are some chinks of light, and we understand that Pakistan has reduced poverty rates over the last 20 years. And when I worked in Nepal in the 1980s, it was, one, it was the sixth poorest country in the world, and I believe it is now out of the bottom ten. Now, in one sense, I'm not sure if we can ever completely eradicate poverty. Jesus said that the poor would always be with us, encouraging us to keep on helping them. Sadly, there have always been, and I fear always will be, those who use their strength or position to exploit others. That happens in almost every country of the world. Some have much more than they need, and some have much less. So while we should be designing laws, taxation and fair work principles in order to tackle poverty, we should remember that there will always be some who seek to get round these laws and to avoid taxation in order to get more for themselves and less for others. Because let's remember that poverty is not something that just happens by chance. Surely, sure, there are natural disasters like earthquakes, droughts and floods which dramatically overturn people's lives. But at the same time, this world has enough food and enough resources that even when disasters do happen, we should be able to restore things and prevent poverty if we put our minds to it. Here in Scotland and most of the Western world, there is a lot of wealth. But the problem is that it is not shared out equally enough. Ideally, the richest people would not take such high salaries, nor store up wealth for themselves and their families. However, we live in the real world, and some people sit on very high incomes and on lavish properties and investments. Therefore, we here at Holyrood and our colleagues at Westminster are left to see how we can deal with this. Now, the Conservatives often tell us that if we only grow the economy, then that will be the answer to almost all these problems. But clearly, that is not the case. I am certainly not against a growing the economy. But we have been growing our economy for hundreds of years, and yet we still face stark levels of poverty. So growing the economy does not solve the problem of poverty if we do not share out better the income and wealth that we have. So in conclusion, we do have poverty in this country, and even more poverty overseas. We can do something about it, and we should be doing more about it. And primarily that means the poorest getting a bigger share of the cake, and the richest taking a smaller share. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mason. We now move to closing speeches. I call first Maggie Chapman, around six minutes. Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As others have done, I thank all those who have provided information for this debate, but more importantly for the work that they do, day in, day out, supporting people throughout all of our communities. We have had much finger-pointing this afternoon, even the accusation that both the SNP and Labour are offering socialism. Wouldn't it be nice that at least, if at least one of them were? As my colleague Patrick Harvey said, we've not had enough focus on what we need to do on our responsibilities here in this place. 
I'd like to reflect in these closing words for the Scottish Greens on the title of this debate, Challenge Poverty Week. It is the title to the week that we are in. What does it mean to challenge poverty? It can't simply be to lament its existence or deplore its manifestations or to ascribe blame for its continuation. The concept of challenge implies an opponent, someone or something we can call to a contest, a trial of strength or skill or endurance. It expects a struggle and a winner. That opponent for us in this chamber representing our constituents is not one another, should not be one another. It is poverty itself. As an activist for peace and disarmament, I'm not generally much taken with military metaphors, but this, the battle against poverty, is an existential struggle, as much as that against climate and environmental devastation. The two, of course, are intimately and inextricably entwined. So though we use the tools of peace, not the weapons of war, we need to act with all the forethought, the strategy and the tactics of any general planning a campaign, or maybe a chess player, a chess grandmaster preparing for a championship match. What are their rules? Number one, know your enemy. Unless we recognise the dimensions, the shapes and the characteristics of poverty, we cannot tell how best to defeat it. Stuart Macmillan articulated this well earlier. A major characteristic is gender. As Close the Gap point out, women are more likely to be in poverty, including in work and persistent poverty, than men, and find it harder to escape. Women have also been hardest hit by both the COVID-19 pandemic and the so-called cost of living crisis, more accurately described, I think, as a cost of greed outrage. And as WASPy women will attest, they will be disproportionately hit by the cut to winter fuel allowance. And there are other characteristics too, other forms of inequality that shape the probability and intensity of poverty. People who are disabled, racially minoritised, single parents and people who are refugees or seeking asylum are all more likely to experience poverty. And when those characteristics intersect, as at Kimberley Crenshaw's thunderous traffic junction, the danger is real, present and potentially lethal. In general, young people experience more poverty than those who are older. But some of the impacts of poverty can be particularly brutal for older people, especially those in poor health. That is why the introduction of means testing for the winter fuel allowance is both cruel and inept. It is a profound mistake, which I hope the Labour, Labour government will have the sense and grace to recognise and reverse. Rule number two, minimise your casualties. This is not a new struggle for us. It has been waged for centuries, for millennia, as John Mason has outlined, with long lists of the fallen. Actually, existing poverty here and now, though, has brutal impacts. Those impacts fall on children today, opening wounds that they bear for life. That is why we, in this Parliament, from all points along the political spectrum, have rightly chosen to make action on child poverty a shared priority. Because we can mitigate those impacts by increasing family incomes through measures like an increased child, Scottish child payment, by ensuring that parents have the childcare support to take up job opportunities, and by ending the inhuman nonsense that is the two-child limit and accompanying rape clause. It's impossible to express the depth of dismay we share with our constituents at the continuation of these bitter Tory legacies. But there are other ways of countering those impacts too. By ensuring that the basic needs of all people, families and communities are met in ways that are accessible, sustainable, compassionate and respectful of human dignity. That means ensuring a safe, safe and secure homes for all, ending the stigma, shame and exclusion of a system where only some children receive free school meals and acting responsibly to address not only the costs of a school day, but the costs of a work day too. We thought we had seen the end of that cynical system of peak rail fares, which benefits those with the privilege of choosing when they travel and punishes those whose travel times are determined by others. Finally, rule number three, create space in which to act. Challenging poverty cannot stop at working to mitigate its effects, essential as this, this is. 
It is also about making systemic changes that don't just react to, to poverty, but proactively prevent it. That means, as the Poverty Alliance outlines, taking active steps towards a minimum income guarantee for all. It means refor reforming the unfair and regressive system of council tax, freeing families from the burden of arrears, of, uh, of, uh, de arrears debt, giving local authorities the powers to raise the resources they need through equitable wealth taxes. It means continuing the vital work to enhance and fulfil human rights. It means, as the Fair Way Scotland Partnership has urged, designing out destitution that has been inflicted upon us by the UK immigration system. And it means ensuring that the third sector has the multi-year funding that it needs to do its invaluable work of support, representation and justice every day. Need to conclude. In conclusion, poverty is our enemy, an ancient and bitter one. But if it is fed by the greed and indifference of some, it can be defeated by the determination of others. Let us be determined and make our challenge a bold one. Because the people, as Emma Roddick and Claire Adamson did well to remind us all, there are people at the end conclude. of the decisions we make. They, our neighbours, friends and families, require nothing less. Thank, Thank you. you. I now call Paul O'Kane. Are in seven minutes, Mr O'Kane. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And in rising to close this debate uh, on behalf of Scottish Labour, I will return to perhaps some of the themes that uh, we opened with. Indeed, Anna Sarwar, uh, Patrick Harvey and others opened uh, with the Joseph Browntree report um, that we uh, saw released yesterday morning on poverty in Scotland. It was a report that made clear uh, that um, there are real and significant challenges we face in terms of poverty in this country. It is indeed a sobering read, as I think was alluded to by many members around the Chamber. And it makes clear that there is a call for both the UK and Scottish governments uh, to step up and to outline how they are going to go uh, further. And I think many in the anti-poverty sector were pleased to see the Secretary of State for Scotland, Ian Murray, and the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, uh, Shirley Ann Somerville, launch and speak uh, about that work together. And I think that is very much the spirit which we wanted to engage in this debate on uh, Challenge Poverty Week today, because um, the Scottish Government, I think, was presented with a chance to spend valuable parliamentary time in Challenge Poverty Week debating the tangible actions across Parliament uh, that we could take. Um, so, for example, to debate the asks of Shelter and Engender, who this week have published research showing how the housing emergency disproportionately impacts women. To debate the, debate the work of One Parent Family Scotland and others working to empower single parents to achieve sustainable and well-paid employment. To debate how we might bring about, about a new approach to dealing with public sector debt to help families with financial struggles as called for by Aberlour. To debate those issues and many other issues. But the Government, in its motion, chose for a very narrow focus in this debate. And I suggest that that actually in itself has been disrespectful to those third sector organisations. I'll just, I'll just I'll finish this point, if I may. I think that is disrespectful to the third sector organisations who put so much into this week and all year round, as we've heard from many colleagues today, tackling the most desperate forms of poverty our society knows. Now, I, I believe um, Ms Stevenson was first, so I will take Ms Stevenson's intervention and then I will come to the First Minister. Colette Stevenson. Uh, I thank the member for taking that intervention. And does Paul O'Kane support the UK Labour government's decision to scrap universal winter fuel payments and can you answer me yes or no? Paul O'Kane. Well, obviously I'm going to come on in my speech to talk about the winter fuel payment. And actually, as we've heard... <laughs> well, hold on, hold on a minute. I mean, I'm literally in my opening section and I've got two interventions from the government. So if they want to hear more about our position, about the criteria I think we could employ, uh, and some of my criticism of the government, then they would do well to listen. Now, I wonder if the First Minister still wishes to make an intervention at this stage. The First Minister. I'm grateful to Mr Keane for giving way. And Mr Keane makes a point about the choice of uh, debating material by the government today. And I respect all of the contributions of the third sector organisations because they are putting forward arguments about trying to improve the situation on poverty. What the government is putting to parliament today is an opportunity for us to speak to one, as, as one, to stop the poverty situation getting worse because of the conscious actions of the Labour government Briefly. in the United Kingdom. That is the sharp point 
of the debate today. Paul O'Kane, I can give you the sign back. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And yet, we have not debated today um, the actions that this Government has taken, which has compounded poverty for children and for families across Scotland and for pensioners. And turning to that point about uh, the winter fuel payment, Anna Sarwar outlined in his contribution very clearly that it is a decision that the UK Labour Government did not want to take. And I think this was elaborated on very clearly by my colleague Michael Mara in terms of the financial reality that was faced by the new UK government in coming to office. And I intervened on Mr Finlay earlier to point out that the Conservatives cannot credibly sit here and take absolutely no responsibility for the mess that they left behind in the public finances. And on the point about £22 billion of cuts, we had air quotes, I think, from Claire Adamson showing, I think, the, the breadth and depth of misunderstanding on the SNP benches. As Mr Mara said, that £22 billion in year uh, a, a black hole is different from the structural deficit. It is a situation where the, the Conservatives spent reserves three times over on issues like the asylum bill that were not known to um, the, the Office for Budget Responsibility and were not known to the, um, the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Um, so that is a very clear reality that we face. I will take one intervention from Mr Finlay. Mr Russell Finlay. Uh, Mr Sarwar was unable or unwilling to tell us whether some form of risk assessment should have taken place before cutting the winter fuel payments. Does Mr Kane believe that should have happened? Paul Kane. Mr Finlay had an opportunity there, as he chose not to when I interviewed him earlier, to apologise for the way that his government, Sorry. his previous government, conducted themselves in regards to the public finances. And let us remember, let nobody forget in this chamber that Mr Finlay is a supporter of Liz Truss, who of course uh, rose her head again at the Conservative Party conference and reminded us of the carnage that was unleashed on this country by the Conservatives. I'll take no lectures from Mr Finlay today. So the point is that this is undoubtedly a decision that um, nobody wanted to make. But I would point to there are a number of issues that I think we need to speak about in the Scottish context this afternoon. Uh, I would remind the Scottish Government that they have taken a decision to scrap uh, many measures that would support people uh, with fuel insecurity across this country. Indeed, the Fuel Insecurity Fund has been scrapped. And that is what the, the core of our amendment gets to, the fact that that money has been taken away in supporting people who might need it this winter. We know that there are £41 million of Barnet consequentials that will come as a result of the extension of the Household Support Fund. And we know that those could be delivered in a different way to support people who need it this winter. We know that that could be reprofiled and, and shown um, to work to support people who really need it in our country. But it seems to me, every time I seem to ask this question of the Cabinet Secretary or of the First Minister, it falls in deaf ears and there is no answer as to why they have cut the fuel insecurity fund and why they are not willing to look at working with Labour in order to utilise that £41 million. Um, Presiding officer, um, it is clear to me that across the course of this debate today we have covered a, a number of issues that the UK Government uh, are ready to act on. And we had um, some fine speeches, I thought, actually, in terms of when we got onto those wider issues. And I thought George Adam, although we did have uh, a, a robust exchange, he got to the point of why we are all here in terms of those we seek to serve in the communities that we represent. And Fergusley Park is a community that's known well to me. And that is why I think it's important that we reflect on the fact that a UK government, within weeks of coming to office, have taken the bold action to put onto the statute a new deal for working people that will lift people out of poverty because we know about the pernicious nature of in-work poverty. It was outlined by John Mason's very thoughtful contribution and by others around the chamber. And we need to make sure that work pays, it is secure and it can lift people out of that structural and deep poverty that we see increasing in Scotland. So I hope that the government will reflect on that today. They are keen to have a new relationship with the UK government. They are keen to collaborate. So I hope on those issues in particular, they will come to the table and with the Child Poverty Task Force and all of the other work that is ongoing uh, through the new UK government. But, Presiding Officer, what is clear is that today's debate cannot just be about uh, one issue and one motion. It has to be about a wider range of issues than that. And it's clear the Scottish Labour have come to this debate today with an amendment that would seek to reinstate the Fuel Insecurity Fund, that would seek to use those Barnet consequentials that are there to ensure that whilst um, we uh, acknowledge the fact that it is an extremely difficult decision, there are options and there are ways to ensure that all families are supported in Scotland, particularly those who suffer most profoundly from fuel insecurity. I'm very grateful, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr O'Kane. I now call Rachel Hamilton around eight minutes. Ms Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And um, I welcome the opportunity to close on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives this evening. 
Russell Finlay clearly touched uh, on a nerve, um, or perhaps the SNP and Labour benches were just embarrassed because they are blaming everyone else except themselves. Talking about problems, not finding solutions, which I noted that Alex Cole Hamilton, uh, uh, not at the moment, thank you. Not, they're talking about problems, not even finding solutions, which I noticed that Alex Cole Hamilton agreed with, um, and even Patrick Harvey. Let's take a look at Mr. Sarwar's government. No apology. Refused to answer Russell Finley's question about whether Labour, the Labour Party will conduct a risk assessment. He was given two opportunities to do that, which Paul O'Kane also refused and deflected. And that is prior to cutting the winter fuel payment for millions of pensioners. Heaven knows the chaos that has ensued with Chief of Staff Sue Gray resigning, Sir Keir Starmer, his freeloading faux pas. He's sort of more like the guy with the glasses, Victor Perkins from Despicable Me. Not even the trade unions support cutting the winter fuel payment. Preside, presiding officer, we find ourselves in a terrifying position where we have two completely incompetent gov governments at UK and Scottish levels. Yes? Paul O'Kane. I'm very grateful to Rachel Hamilton for taking intervention. Surely she recognises that what she has just said belittles this debate. This is a debate about challenging poverty, and surely she must recognise that she must take responsibility for the actions of her previous government, who salted the earth and who destroyed the British economy. Rachel Hamilton. I thank, I thank Paul O'Kane for that. Uh, intervention. It just proves that Paul O'Kane is entirely embarrassed about how his government have yeah. uh, behaved in the last three months. John Swinney seemed to enjoy my colleagues criticising Labour um, because he finds himself in a unique position. But two wrongs don't make a right, Mr Swinney. Just because some of the heat has been transferred from the SNP to a completely incompetent Labour government doesn't mean that the SNP's dangerous policy choices are being ignored by Scotland's pensioners and young people. First Minister, we, we want solutions. We will support your motion today because 240,000 children are in poverty. Patrick Harvey is correct. I cannot believe that I'm finding myself agreeing with Patrick Harvey. I, I can't believe I'm just saying that. It is about choice. It is about the SNP choices um, that we unite behind tackling poverty. And Alex Cole Hamilton, also the Liberal Democrats, have ensured that we look to offering solutions. I'd be delighted. Patrick Harvey. I'm very grateful to the member for giving way. I'm not quite sure I'm grateful for her expressing agreement with my position so clearly. I wonder, though, if she would reflect on why she got it so wrong when she once called for the minimum wage to be abolished. Why on earth... How on earth do we think we can tackle poverty without ensuring that poverty wages are abolished? Rachel Hamilton. I, I mean, I completely agree with Patrick Harvey. That was taken out of context because some employers pay more than the minimum wage and therefore they are giving uh, more to those people who are stuck on the minimum wage. Um, but the causes of poverty are deep-rooted and we have heard across the chamber it affects many people. Um, many communities. For, for example, in my constituency, um, I don't know what Maggie Chapman's laughing at, I'm not sure if she's ever actually employed anybody, but um, the causes of poverty are deep-rooted, especially in Ettrick, Roxburgh and Berwickshire. The impact of poverty is usually generational and leads to unique challenges and inequalities. Presiding officer, poverty can affect anyone, no matter their age, and over 150,000 pensioners live in poverty in Scotland, with over half of those living in severe poverty. Yesterday I was out speaking with residents in Kelso, and the number one issue that came up was the removal of the winter fuel payment by both the Labour and the SNP governments. Many were worried about how they'll heat their home, and it's estimated that 16,000 pensioners in the borders are set to bear the brunt of reckless decisions by these parties in the next few months. One resident told me, and I quote, that without any support they will have to choose to eat or heat. Another constituent summed up the impact that this will have on ordinary people. They stated, and I quote, that this is a dreadful policy of Labour and SNP against the just getting by Scottish pensioners like us who are dreading the winter bills and the cold. They, like many pensioners across Scotland, Scotland as we've heard today, are feeling unsupported and anxious about how they will afford to heat their homes. And the impact of fuel poverty has very real consequences for our public services. One couple recently contacted me to share their anxiety as we approach the colder weather. They said that their health isn't good and that they both feel the cold more severely than others. 
But what Stuart Macmillan did not mention about independent age is that they have assessed the impact of fuel poverty, highlighting that older people are the most vulnerable to these impacts, with most likely to suffer, for example, from respiratory and cardiovascular disease as a result of cold homes. We know that deprivation is a key driver of people already accessing our stretched A and E departments, and with many health boards, including NHS borders, already facing extreme pressures, the decision to remove the winter fuel payment will undoubtedly put our NHS into crisis this winter. Presiding officer, I've highlighted just one example of the real impact of these policy decisions in my constituency, but this situation will be similar right across Scotland. And unfortunately, under the SNP, examples of poverty have become the norm across Scotland. And sadly, the SNP also continue to dis be disengaged, disinterested in dealing with the root causes of poverty. poverty. Instead, they choose to occupy their time pushing constitutional grievances, as we've heard today, at the cost of ordinary people across yeah. Scotland. They choose yeah. to blame others for their incompetence yeah. and their failures. Presiding officer, we have stopped looking ahead to a... We have stopped looking ahead to a more bright and positive future for Scotland by growing the economy. Yes, I will take an intervention. Stuart McMillan. <coughs> I thank Rachel Hamilton for taking the intervention. And just to, on, on that latter point that uh, Ms Hamilton was speaking about, would Ms Hamilton actually apologise for the actions of her government over the last 14 years, but also for the actions of previous Conservative governments that have driven people into poverty and deprivation? Rachel Hamilton. And I, well, give you the I, I would um, return the compliment to Stuart McMillan by asking him to apologise for 17 years of SNP incompetence. So, let's scratch beneath the surface of this SNP incompetence and put rhetoric over, and instead of putting rhetoric over reality and consistently failing to bring forward any substantive plans. These are not my views, they are the views of leading poverty charities. Save the Children have stated that plans in the programme for government, as I said earlier in an intervention to Stuart Macmillan, do nothing to shift the dial on poverty. Not only have the SNP failed to bring people out of poverty, but through their own financial mismanagement, they have in fact put the nation's finances into a state of poverty. Presiding officer, the way to a fairer society, after 17 years, of this SNP neglect is by boosting everyone up rather than dragging people down. As Conservatives, we believe the best way to pull people out of poverty yes. is by creating a positive vision through aspirational policies. As Russell Finlay stated, we will offer an alternative way forward to the high tax, low ambition Hollywood consensus yep. by standing up for everyone who just wants to see their politicians show some, show some common sense for a change. Presiding, presiding officer, I see my time is short. I will close, but let's end with a positive note by recognising the role volunteers and charities play in picking up the slack left by SNP, as articulated by my colleague Miles Briggs. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Hamilton. I would now call Shirley Amson to wind up the debate. Cabinet Secretary, if you could take us up to just before five o'clock, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I am pleased that we are having this debate about the UK Government's decision to restrict the eligibility for winter fuel payments because it has had a devastating consequence for the planned launch of the Pension Age winter heating payment. Recent research by Age UK shows across the UK 1.6 million older people who are living in poverty will lose their winter fuel payment as a result of the UK Government's decision to restrict eligibility to those in receipt of relevant benefits. The research shows a further 900,000 older people across the UK whose incomes are just above the poverty line will also lose the winter fuel payment. And these people have incomes which are no more than £55 per week above the poverty line. And the reason many of these people have incomes just above that line is that small occupational pension that they've saved during their working lives for, just doing as they were instructed and encouraged to do, to try and ensure they could have that more comfortable retirement. But when that time comes, the unfairness of the pension credit cliff edge means they are set to struggle financially. As the First Minister said in his opening remarks, this Government will continue to press the UK Government to reverse its damaging decision on restricting the eligibility of winter fuel payments, and this Parliament has an opportunity to add its voice today. Now, the debate opens with a, a fair degree of um, blaming between Russell Finlay and uh, Paul O'Kane and others from Labour. 
And I have to say, while that was a, 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 a spectacle to behold, can I suggest to them that responsibility is shared? Because yeah. the Tory mm -hmm. austerity is now Labour austerity, yeah. the Tory two-child cap is now the Labour two-child cap, yeah. and the Tory age discrimination and universal credit is now Labour's age discrimination yeah. in universal credit. Labour had the opportunity to be different, mm -hmm. and they have chosen not to, presiding officer. And on a particular aspect, which I am sure many people will reflect upon, when I asked Russell Finlay what he meant about cutting Social Security, whether that was against children, disabled people or carers, then he did not answer, presiding officer. And I am more than happy to take an intervention to him if he has decided which one of those people that he would actually like to cut the benefits from. Nothing again, presiding well, officer. Yeah. Oh, no, here we go. Russell Finlay. We're returning to the key point, which is this Scottish Government has been in power for 17 years. They're in receipt of the record block grant and they're utterly incapable of spending it yeah. properly. Yeah. And maybe they take some responsibility for that. Cabinet Secretary. And within those years in office, presiding officer, we have introduced the Scottish Child Payment. Yeah, we have yeah. delivered social security and dignity, fairness and respect. Yeah, and in yeah, one of yeah. his first major speeches as leader, Can the people know. have heard that he wants to cut their benefits, yeah. presiding officer. Mr. Sarwar suggested we looked at the causes of poverty, and he's quite right. Can I suggest some to him? The two child cap, the benefit cap. Keith Brown is quite right. In Channels Poverty Week, neither of those policies help alleviate poverty, but here we are with Labour keeping them. And when it comes to the issue of protecting pensioners, I'm reflecting on a letter that I understand was sent out directly from Keir Starmer uh, to pensioners across the UK. And I quote, presiding officer, I know how much Britain's older generation have contributed to our country and the debt that is owed to them. I know how much a struggle it's been in recent times. I'll never betray Britain's pensioners, presiding officer. Well, that didn't take long, presiding officer, for people to see the reality of this. And we've heard much from Labour on their asks about the £41 million, which they suggest is coming in consequentials. You'll forgive me if I'm slightly sceptical about that, presiding officer, because if people will cast their minds back, not that long ago, Anis Sarwar reads my lips, no austerity under Labour. And yet somehow we're supposed to read the lips of the Labour Party today and somehow expect this to miraculously appear. This money, certainly. Paul Kane. So, so the, you know, the Cabinet Secretary doesn't need a miraculous intervention, I think it was she was saying. What she, she needs to do is read the letter from the Secretary of State for Working Pensions to confirm the, the extension of the Household Support Fund and then the information that came from the House of Commons Library that confirms £41 million of consequentials to the Scottish Budget. Cabinet Secretary. I have also read the Scottish Fiscal Commission report which says in its analysis that there is significant uncertainty on the level of funding which the Scottish Government will receive from the UK Government ahead of the UK Budget. Because you cannot, you cannot, if we are genuinely going to be fiscally responsible, do this on a wing and a prayer, presiding yep. officer, yep. that some money will somehow be left yep. when we have the Chancellor talking about difficult decisions, a Prime Minister warning off a painful budget to come. Yep. You'll forgive me, presiding officer, if I am sceptical about how far this will go. Because we have heard, if, if Paul O'Kane will forgive me, I'll be a, a, a little bit more progress and I'm happy to take another intervention. We heard also during the uh, election, presiding officer, that Labour were going to put the country before party. Mm. Well, now it's the party before pensioners. We've seen change being delivered, but the change is that fuel bills are going up while their support is going down. I'm not sure that was the change that people had in mind. But we do have an opportunity today, presiding officer, every single MSP, to actually support this motion, to speak with one voice, to actually put pensioners before party and work together on this. I did promise to take another venture from Mr O'Kane and I'll try to get back Paul to Mr Harvey. 
So, the point um, that I was going to make when the Cabinet Secretary had reached that point in her speech uh, was why the Fuel and Security Fund was cut. So she has used that money previously, which came to the Scottish Budget, and then she chose to cut it. So that would be the first point. And the second point is, she talks about w wanting to engage. Why will she not engage on that concept of that £41 million and talk to us about how we might deploy it to support people in fuel poverty? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, Mr Kerr, I'm, I'm very happy, and the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and, and other ministers are very happy to engage with Scottish Labour, but we cannot, I go back, to actually trying to deliver a budget without knowing how much money is coming. And I would refer him once again to what the Scottish Fiscal Commission has said on this, presiding officer. We've also heard a great deal about the fiscal black hole that apparently came as an absolute surprise to the Labour Party when they got into power. Now, the First Minister made very clear during the election campaign that this was a real and present danger. He was told not to scaremonger, that austerity would never happen. He proposed a solution about changing the fiscal rules. Somehow, it took Labour getting into office to actually realise that the Tories had left the economy in a mess, presiding officer. And even, even if that was true, even if that was true, Claire Anderson was quite right. They noticed and then they decided to take the cuts out against our pensioners, presiding officer. And I'm happy to wait, give way to Mr Mara if he still thinks that that's the right decision to take. Michael Mara. I can well, maybe have to explain this again to the Cabinet Secretary. What happens? Well, if I, I think I probably. Well, I certainly had to explain it to the First Let's Minister. Let's hear Mr Mara. I had to explain it to the First Minister earlier on, presiding officer, that in the longer term there is a structural deficit in the budget. But in this year, there's a £22 billion a year gap this year. That's what we're talking about and what has to be dealt with. Cabinet Secretary. Well, presiding officer, Whoa. two weeks in a row I got mansplained the capital and revenue budget by Anis Sarwar, and I'm delighted that Michael Mara's just joined that in today, presiding officer. Well, let me say to him, the financial situation is a consequence of austerity, and Labour are continuing austerity. That's the political choice that Labour have made today. <laughs> I'll give way to Patrick Harvey. Patrick Harvey. I'm, uh, I'm grateful and I agree with a great deal of what the Cabinet Secretary is saying, but does she understand my disappointment that the only two positions with any credibility before us today each point the finger exclusively at the other government? Does she recognise that whatever the context of the UK government, in terms of power or in terms of budgets, the onus is on the Scottish Government to go much further than it has gone if it wants to be successful in challenging poverty? Cabinet Secretary. Can I, I thank Patrick Harvey for that intervention because I was, I was just about to come to his uh, remarks actually just specifically on that point. I, I would agree with the First Minister that the motion today isn't about apportioning blame. This is about the Parliament speaking with one voice about a policy change that I hope Parliament can unite against. But he's quite right that we should work together and he's quite right that there should be challenges presented to the Scottish Government on that. The budget discussions are of course ongoing. There's a number of challenges and opportunities which his uh, speech again quite right um, if Mr Briggs will forgive me, I have taken a number of interventions so far. Uh, there are a number of challenges and opportunities that Mr Harvey's speech and others um, actually presented. And I think that's all something that all parties should take advantage of, is the fact that we are at the start of those budget discussions. And those members, and Mr Harvey was, 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 was not the worst in this, uh, certainly by any means, but those who came to the chamber with, with a list of requests and of ask and demand, well, absolutely, let's get together and discuss those as part of that um, budget. And I, I know from working f with him, over many years that he'll take that offer up. I hope it and take it seriously as we have done uh, in the past. Uh, presiding officer, can I conclude uh, with um, actually picking up on some remarks that Alec Cole Hamilton um, made? He, he said that this is a missed opportunity having such a focused debate. Can I say I, I, very politely I disagree with him on that. This, as I've said, is an opportunity for us to speak to one voice as a parliament. There are many other things which we could have debated and some of it has been aired uh, today. If I have time, presiding officer? I, I'm afraid I don't. Uh, sorry, Mr Cole Hamilton. But this is an opportunity for us to come together today on this one issue. I believe it's an opportunity for us to have a strong and a united voice for this parliament to speak with a purpose. 
Every single MSP has that opportunity today, and I very much hope that they take it, President Officer. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Challenge Poverty Week. It is now time to move on to the next item of business. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 14842 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on changes to the business programme. Any member who wishes to speak to the motion should press their request to speak button now. And I call on Jamie Hepburn to move the motion. Move, presenting officer. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak to the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 14842 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. And there are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. Oh, point of order, Jackie Dunbar. President Officer, um, I'm aware that there are some members um, who are still trying to get into the Zoom link but cannot manage to get in. Thank you. We will we'll proceed, Ms Dunbar, but we will keep an eye on that situation. Thank you very much. So there are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that Amendment 14820.1, in the name of Russell Finlay, which seeks to amend Motion 14820, in the name of John Swinney, on Challenge Poverty Week, be agreed. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access digital voting.